Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of what the hell's the date? Oh, August 17th, 2017. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight, and I'll be presiding tonight. Um, as is our usual custom, before we actually call the roll and determine we have a quorum and start an open meeting, we give the public an opportunity to speak on any topic, uh, constraining themselves to th any individual, please constrain yourself to three minutes or less. Three, three minutes isn't the goal, it's just an end point. And um, when you, when I call your name, please come up and state, restate your name and correct my pronunciation and tell us your address for the public record. Um, the rules limiting commentary is basically we ask you to respect the decorum of the chamber. Um, do not defame anyone. I've often said this, you don't, you can't defame others. You can defame us, however. We're public figures. So you're, you're welcome. <laughs> To say nice things too, we d we have no problem with that. Although it's rarely heard, and we um, the uh, and as yeah, so we keep it under three minutes. Don't defame anyone. No cussing. I think you get the general idea. So, and it, as I said, you're not constrained by topic. You can speak on anything. Uh, so first up, we have Daphne Stevens, please. Stevens, and you probably can't see my green button, but I'm a member of the Green Party, which has long supported single payer universal health care and preventive care for all. We believe that health care is a right, not a privilege. Our current health care system lets tens of thousands of people die each year by excluding them from adequate care while exor its exorbitant costs are crippling our economy. The United States is the only industrialized nation in the world without a national health care system. Under a universal, comprehensive, national single-payer health care system, the administrative waste of private insurance corporations would be redirect redirected to patient care. If the United States were to shift to a system of universal coverage and a single payer plan, as in Canada and in many European countries, the savings in administrative costs would be more than enough to offset the cost of additional care. Expenses for businesses currently providing coverage would be reduced while well, state and local governments would pay less because they would receive reimbursement for services provided to the previously uninsured and because public programs would cease to be the dumping ground for high-risk patients and those rejected by the HMOs when they became disabled and unemployed. In addition, People would gain the peace of mind in knowing that they have the health care they need. No longer would people have to worry about the prospect of financial ruin if they became seriously ill, are laid off of their jobs, or are injured in an accident. <coughs> the Green Party supports a wide range of health care services, including conventional medicine, as well as the teaching funding and practice of complementary, integrative, and licensed alternative health care approaches. I'm not seeing my... No, I, yeah, I'm sorry. You've got another 45 seconds. Okay, I will um, also throw in that the environment um, is really important for health care. It includes the quality of air, water, and food, and the health of our workplaces, homes, and schools. Thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. There should be a clock on there. Go to the home screen. This is my. Oh, this is yours. So it's going to be my be. Right. Okay. So um, normally we have a clock up there. We're we're uh, we've jerry rigged the council tonight, and we because John Fry is here, 
and he is uh, sitting in for our, normal, our regular administrative assistant who we went and made the interim city clerk and John uh, is taking over and we're just, so we don't have the clock. That's a long explanation, we don't have the clock. So try and get a sense of what three minutes is. I'll, my eyebrows will go up when you got like 25 seconds left or something like that. And, and I'll politely let you know if you're running over. How's that? Okay, uh, Daniel Morata, please. Daniel Murata. Uh, my address is 117 South Street in Northampton. Uh, I am a physician and third year resident in psychiatry. Uh, first, I wanted to thank the City Council for considering this resolution in support of Senate Bill 619, an act establishing Medicare for All in Massachusetts. And I want to urge the Council to pass this resolution to build on the existing momentum that now exists on the national, state, and local level around the issue of health care reform. One might be distressed by recent efforts to repeal the ACA, but the flip side of this recent chaos is the opportunity for real reform. This is a consciousness-raising moment in which Americans are coming to see healthcare as a right, and which we as a whole are appreciating that we are putting more into the current health system than we are getting out of it. On the state level, we have the momentum of this existing piece of legislation that is co-sponsored by 55 members of the State House and Senate. On the local level, we have the Western Massachusetts towns of Colerain, Deerfield, Leiden, Leverett, and Plainfield that have already enacted resolutions this year in support of the Medicare for All bill. If Northampton adds its voice, Western Mass is sending a clear message to the State House that Massachusetts residents want a system that secures affordable and universal health care. While applying for, me for medical school in 2008, I followed closely the passage of the Affordable Care Act, and it was at that time that I first started to d delve into the iniquities and inefficiencies of the current health care system. Now as a physician, I am faced with these issues in practice, with the hurdles I have to jump over to provide care, and with the hurdles patients face to access care. To give an example, a few weeks ago, I am taking care of a nine-year-old boy with significant mental health issues who was urgently in need of a medication that is going to help him right away, a medication that is being delayed because of the authorization process required by his health insurance carrier. We're heading into the weekend without the medication, and the boy's mother is worried that she is not going to be able to keep her son safe. Friday afternoon, I am on the phone with the insurance rep and the pharmacist trying to arrange approval for an emergency supply of this medication. What I want to highlight in this example is that everyone is trying to do the right thing. The insurance representative, the pharmacist, the patient's mother, and myself as the provider. We all want him to get the medication he needs. But the problem was larger than our best intentions. We were serving a function in a dysfunctional system. In a Medicare for All system, we could avoid situations like this because the landscape of who approves and who pays for what would be much simplified. To paraphrase the President, healthcare is complex. <laughs> <laughs> Accessibility is not necessarily affordability, and affordability is not necessarily quality. Adequate reform must address the mutual interplay of these three factors of access, cost, and quality, and a Medicare for All system would do just that. It would improve access by guaranteeing coverage. It would lower costs through the robust cost control mechanism of having a single payer negotiating the prices of medical procedures, devices, and pharmaceuticals. And it would improve quality by replacing a system in which people defer care for conditions that benefit from early diagnosis and treatment simply because they cannot afford it. A system that passes on to its people the crude calculus of choosing between their life and their livelihood is an immoral system. How long are we going to listen to arguments that the market will sort things out when every year health care costs continue to rise? How long are we going to endure short-term fixes at the expense of real lasting reform? How long are we going to entertain the pernicious fiction of the consumer-driven health care system that falsely equates health care with goods traded on the market? Health care is not a commodity. It is a social service. It is a right. And to say it plainly, corporate profit has no place in the care of the sick. The current system that says otherwise has proven itself to be both financially unsustainable and morally objectionable. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, Margaret Miller, please. Margaret Miller. Hi, my name is Margaret Miller. I'm a psychologist. Oh, my address is 857 West Hampton Road in Florence. Um, I'm a psychologist in private practice in Northampton, and I am speaking to advocate for universal health care as a provider. Um, first of all, I think that universal health care would eliminate an enormous amount of wasted time. Uh, practitioners spend enormous amounts of time trying to understand and function within different insurance companies, different authorization procedures, different billing procedures, and 
if it's confusing for the patient, it's equally confusing to the practitioner, and it's an enormous waste of time. That time could be better spent providing ser direct service to patients. Number two, I think that universal health care is a right, and that right now, I believe that the profit motive of private insurance companies, as well as pharmaceutical companies, is taking priority over the needs of patients. And there are men, there is an absolute inequality of access to services. And there are many patients that are not able to access services because their insurance company either doesn't cover the service or their deductibles are so high that they cannot possibly pay for them. So it's become a system where the wealthy are able to access any services that they need, while those who are less fortunate are not able to. And as a practitioner, I can't live with that kind of inequality of access to services. So I advocate for this universal health care, and I urge the council to support it. Thank you very much. Uh, Fran Boatman, please. Good evening, counselors. Uh, thank you so much for considering the- Fran, I'm going to interrupt you and oh, ask- I'm sorry. You. I'm Fran Volkman. I live at 24 Crab Apple Lane here in Northampton at the Lathrop community. Um, I, and I want to thank you all for putting the uh, bill uh, 617619 S619 on your agenda as a resolution tonight. I think it's just so important right now. I want to give you a little personal a little personal case study. Uh, my partner, Joan, had a shoulder that basically disintegrated. No rotator cuff left, and the pain got worse and worse and worse, and the use of the arm got worse and worse and worse, until she was literally pacing the floor at night in pain, um, and something had to be done, and a normal shoulder replacement wasn't going to do it. Um, and we finally got a kind of a high-fangled reverse shoulder replacement done in Boston. Um, and it transformed her life. This was done in June. Uh, she's a new person. Uh, and I can tell you it was all done with Medicare. So it's a system that sure does work. All done with Medicare. So that was my first take-home message from this. Uh, it also made me realize what it must be like to be all those people out there who have conditions as bad or worse than Jones, who don't have that option. I don't know what they do. I don't know how they can do it. Um, and it seems so terribly unfair in this country to have people in that situation. My second take-home message from our experience was that the price of this was unbelievable. Um, we don't even have the final bill for the surgery, but two days in the hospital in Boston, $18,000. So here we have a system that works and a cost that's just off the charts. And we're at a time now when things are probably going to get worse before they get better. Uh, it's totally unsustainable. And we have to get this thing to a different place fairly soon. I don't know if Bill 619 is the final version of what we should do, but it's to sure a good start. And we need to get it out of committee get it out of committee, get it to a place where it can have input and discussion and good ideas and move it along. Uh, and that's why it's so important for people like you and cities like ours to urge the legislature to get this thing going so that we can come up with a solution to this problem that works for everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So just a heads up, uh, everyone's run over. So <laughs> if, <laughs> if you feel like your point's been made, consider the fact that we've registered that. And if you have a new point, please make that. That'd be great. 
Uh, Ed Ward, please. Hi, my name is Edward Ward. I live at 368 Burt's Pit Road in Florence. And what's caught my eye about the healthcare stuff is the administrative costs. You see some figures about European countries and, and the US and, and the administrative costs are so dramatically different. And I see it at home. My wife is a therapist with a private practice and she spends 20% of her time, she <coughs> estimates, on billing, just the billing part of uh, administration. And it's, you know, 20 different companies, they all have different uh, forms and they seem to be very happy to send anything back if there's any, uh, any minor trivial thing wrong with it. And uh, she works with kids, you know, she, a, a whole bunch of, uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, you know, messy divorces, physical abuse, sexual abuse. And if she didn't have that, you know, if she got some of that 20% of time she, she spends on administration back, she'd be working with more kids. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, you know, with the single payer, more kids would be, be able to get the care they need. And this would help us all, you know, for years down the road. So I just, I'm, I'm just, uh, supporting this Medicare for all, and I'm, I'm really hopeful everybody here will. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Lou Bosley? <laughs> Not even close, right? B's right. Okay. Hi, I'm Mary Lou Bully. Um, I live at 51 and a half Hatfield Street in Northampton. Um, I'm with the Northampton Area League of Women Voters. Um, and in 1987, the local Northampton League decided we need to look at health care. And the stories we've heard tonight were the stories we heard 30 years ago. The, the problems existed then, they still exist now. The League of Women Voters of the National, the National League in 1990 decided to study health care and we were, had a leg up on them because we'd already started. Uh, they undertook a two year study of the funding and delivery of health care in the United States. and. Um, their position that they came up with was to promote a health care system for the United States that provides access to a basic level of quality care for all U.S. residents, including behavioral health and controls health care costs. The position calls for a national insurance plan financed through general taxes, commonly known <coughs> as the single payer approach. Um, and that's basically what we learned back in those days. In, 19, in 2016 at the, the National Convention of the League of Women Voters, the convention concurred with p positions held by the two states in the United States that had already studied the single payer business. And they concurred that yes, the National League would support a single payer plan. And we, so we thank you. We hope you'll support the resolution on Medicare for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Chris Flory, please. My name is Chris Flory. I practice primary care internal medicine in Northampton for 31 years. Now I live in Williamsburg. It was painful to realize at the last 10 years of my practice um, how poorly our health care system, which I had worked in all that time, was doing. How much time I was spending having to negotiate for my patients the ins and outs of each different HMO, how my staff had to know the paperwork and the requirements of each different HMO. <coughs> need to change that. It was not serving <laughs> patients well, even as, as we were working so hard to do so. I think we're at a unique moment in time for many reasons, but uh, one of them is what's happened in healthcare the last month or two. Uh, I think with the threat of having healthcare removed from however many millions of people, there was a groundswell um, of opposition, and that had something to do with the Republican efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act uh, failing. Uh, I think there is a groundswell now in favor of improving our health care system in a way that's going to work and going to last. And I hope that all of you will think about what statement you will make here tonight to try to increase that groundswell. Uh, we can do much better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lucy Garbus. Hi, 
Um, I was going to use my cell phone, but I'm, it's going to make me too nervous. So uh, sure. hopefully I'll be under three minutes. Hopefully I'll be under two minutes. <clears throat> my name is Lucy Garbus. I live at 11 Mountain Laurel Path in Florence, and I'm speaking tonight to urge the City Council to support this resolution to pass Medicaid for all. I have been working in a community health center for the past year and a half as a pediatric primary care nurse practitioner. I went there thinking that this was the last stop for poor children in our community and that everyone would be served regardless of ability to pay. What I found there was very different. While it is usually easy for children in Massachusetts to get Medicaid, therefore thinking that children have access to care, there are often glitches in the system and rarely are these the fault of the family. I was shocked to discover that our clinic is full of people whose only job it is to make sure that everyone's Medicaid is in working order before they can be seen for each visit. When there is a problem, the family is told by these care managers that they can be seen, but that they will be expected to pay. A few months ago, I saw a two-year-old who had a very severe cough. When they ran the mother's Medicaid card, they said it was not working. She was told that she could see me for the cough, but that she would be responsible for the $200 visit. Of course, she kept the appointment and the child received the needed medicine. And instead of scheduling a follow-up visit, which would have been the best care for this child, I called her to see if the child was improving. This way, she would not have to come in and risk increasing her bill. She was put on a payment plan for the $200. Another child was sent a bill for her first two newborn visits at our clinic because the mother's social worker forgot to fill out her part of the Medicaid paperwork. Mom is now trying to pay off the bill for the $375 to see me for this mistake. In addition, she received a bill from the hospital for the baby's first day of life that mom says she can't possibly afford to pay. These are only two examples of the children who actually make it all the way to my exam room. <clears throat> I do not know what is happening to the ones who choose not to come because they can't afford it or because they are worried about getting harassed about payment plans. These children living in poverty are the most vulnerable members of our society who are well known to have lower quality of health, higher rates of mental health issues. The lack of universal health care and the complicated health insurance world puts up nearly impossible roadblocks for them to get timely and thorough care, leaving them at risk for serious physical and mental health issues that will go unaddressed until they reach a crisis point, sending them to the emergency room and sometimes into an inpatient psych hospital. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. Medicare for all will be a great first step in the journey toward fighting this injustice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marty Nathan. Marty. Marty Nathan and I live at 24 Massasoit Street in Northampton. <coughs> thank you, Council. Thank you, Bill. Um, I will be brief because most most of the things that I wanted to say have already been said. But I want to talk about my particular uh, experience in my over 40 years of practice in this country. The last 22 of which have been spent in in the Pioneer Valley. Um, I have, uh, I have been a member of Physicians for a National Health Program for as long as I can remember. Um, and I have always chosen to work in for the underserved. Now, let me tell you what the, the underserved means in this country. It means people who don't have ac access to health insurance and are too poor to pay. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you live in a far rural area, although sometimes it can mean that because there are particular uh, there are demographics to it. But it means lack of access to insurance. Um, I have spent all of those years either rationing health care myself or witnessing the self-rationing of health care by patients who know that the bill that they face is impossible to pay. 
even when they have insurance, that may be true. I have had, uh, I have had patients who have gone, had horrible thyroid conditions, who when they lost their insurance, stopped seeing me for nine months at a time and came back in heart failure. I had one man who was having a heart attack and refused to go to the hospital because he just didn't have insurance. Um, I have had, so many people who just haven't come in until they were near death's door. And that is because of all the things that have been described so m well by others, the, the lack of total coverage of people's health care, the spottiness of it, the forms that are impossible to, to fill up be because they're so complex. We need Medicare for all. We have needed it for as long as I have been a doctor. We need to, it to prevent the bankruptcies that pull people out of their homes, make them homeless and sicker. Uh, we need it for us poor or providers who would really much rather be helping people than filling out those goddamn forms. Um, and I think that this is a wonderful city council in a wonderful city that I love. And I know that just like the Democratic Party in the state of Massachusetts, you will support health, uh, universal health care, Medicare for all. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Lands. Hi, thank you. I'm Susan Lance. I live at 74 Lyman Road. And I have to say, I have the great privilege of being over 65. <laughs> <laughs> and I have the um, hmm, humility to say that for some reason, I thought the state of Massachusetts was okay with its medical policies because Obamacare was fashioned after what we had in Massachusetts. I hadn't paid really particular attention, <coughs> in other words, because, and my health care is good because I happen to be on the blessed Medicare single payer for all. But when I became aware, well, number one, that if we're ever going to get single payer in this country, probably the way to go is going to be state by state. And by cracky, what's a better state than the state of Massachusetts to lead that cause? So, and where do we start? Locally. I bet you've all heard that before. <laughs> so here we are, and we're starting at our local level. We're asking you to be a cog in the wheel <coughs> to support this, to wake up our legislator, which uh, legislation, whatever that word is, <laughs> that apparently a bill, this bill has been there for 20 years, and it's never gotten out of committee. That is just a disgrace, a total disgrace. So I think, you know, we, and this is one thing we can do, is to start here. I also want to say I happen to have a 53-year-old son who has type 1 diabetes. I was shocked when he told me his insurance cost is seven, over $700 a month. What is going to happen to him if pre-diagnosis things kick in? <coughs> Scary. I have a friend here in Northampton that I just came to understand. She's on Mass Health. So to make ends meet, occasionally she has to get a temp job. She does that, she gets over the Mass Health line, she's kicked off insurance. She can't afford insurance on her own, it's way too expensive. She's in great pain, she needs a hip replacement, she can't schedule it because she doesn't know whether she's going to have mass health at that time. This is just no way that we should have to live, particularly in this civilized country. So thank you for your support of S. Bill 619. Thank you. So that's all I have signed up. Does anyone else wish to speak at this time? Oh, yes, of course there are. Um, uh, we'll start with Claudia and then we'll go to Mary. And I didn't see who's out in the end, you're in the back. Okay, Claudia, you're first. My lucky night, there's no clock. 
<laughs> well, you know, Claudia, Claudia let me emphasize, there is a clock, it's just not visible, so. So I, I expected there was going to be a, a crowd and a vigil outside, and actually I came last week and Ed Ward was here. Claudia, and I, can you, you need to state your name and address, and I'm Claudia sorry. Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. <laughs> So I'm really glad this came in front of the council and I'm hoping that it will pass. But I'm here to just remind people that health, like the old 60s sign, you know, war is not healthy for children and other living things. And much as our own health care is on our minds, there is an international context here that we're at spending gazillions of dollars to destroy other people and their countries and their homes and the environment that we all li have to live with and their health is suffering. So it's not just cholera in Yemen, it's now cancer in Syria, it's been cancer in Iraq forever. If we weren't doing this, we would have plenty of money here to take care of our own needs. So I'm just saying, don't let's stop with this. Let's really be conscious of how the healthcare issue fits into other issues in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are you able to get through? Mary Ford. I am a retiree living at 6 Massasoit Street in Ward 2A. Um, I, I have some stories uh, similar to what you've, you've heard, um, true stories, and I work, a lot of people don't know this, um, before being a government official, I worked in healthcare and afterwards, not as a provider, a clinical person, uh, but as a, an outreach person, uh, customer service and so on. And I, I literally had a case in eastern Franklin County at one point where a family called distraught, having just heard of the community health center in, uh, Turner's Falls, and at this point it was too late to help them. This was a guy with a factory job, uh, good quality, like a supervisor. He had infection at home following surgery. Because of that, he couldn't go back to work. Because of that, he lost his job. Because of that, he lost his health insurance because the family chose to keep paying their mortgage. They called us when they were about to lose their mortgage. All of because this broken health system. So that's my bad story. The good story is, hey, I've been on Medicare for several years now with a nice supplemental plan uh, from uh, the state's group insurance commission. And uh, a lot of you know, I was diagnosed with celiac disease some years ago. Uh, because I had a great nurse practitioner uh, who said, you got to go to the GI person, referred me. I didn't have to worry about my insurance covering the GI person. Sure enough, told me I had a bad case of celiac, which is now much better with diet, but it does do some lasting damage. And what a lot of you never heard was uh, when I went to meet my college roommate in New York City to go to the Metropolitan Opera for the first and last time, I think, in my life, um, I, I had a fall, some splinters, and a scrape on my shin, came home, and it very quickly developed into a MRSA type of affection. Because I had what in healthcare is sometimes called a primary care home, a long standing relationship with a medium sized group of people. They knew my insurance, I knew my insurance was good. I was in there every other day for two weeks, and the wound itself was treated, and I was given additional first aid instructions, and custom medications were blended so that um, the infection could be localized instead of spreading throughout my, my body. That was a, kind of like Fran's story. Um, it was a success story. But ask yourself this, 
what was the value added to the insurance company, uh, to, to insurance <coughs> as a commodity on a marketplace? <coughs> it's a way of paying the bills. The fact that I knew my bills would be paid, that there was security in that payment mechanism, that was the value of the plan to me. Were there competing plans? That there were some. Um, nothing that would have offered a greater benefit to me, and that exposes not only what people not so fortunate have to go through in in between health plans and so on. Mary? But it exposes. It, excuse me, I'm sorry. I, I gave you the balance of Claudia's time, which I didn't know we were going to have. To be uh, honest, but, uh, um, the idea that there's something positive in the U.S. for keeping health insurance under the free market system. I'm less concerned, frankly, with the fact that for-profit people pursue uh, health insurance expansion than with the fact that we're in a system where competition is bogus. It's not like my buying my laptop or my car, where there are new innovations and worthwhile things to compare. Health insurance is strictly a way to make sure the doctors and nurses and hospitals get paid and that the patients don't have to sit around the kitchen table worrying about it. Having competition in that circumstance is useless. And our state reps and senators ought to tell the lobbyists so. Correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe our state senator supports this bill. Um, our state rep is now chairing the Finance Committee on Health Care. So I hope everybody makes sure they convey their thinking to both of them. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good evening. I'm going to be very brief. I'm Michelle Serra, 68 Lake Street in Florence, Massachusetts. Um, this is my... <laughs> passion. Um, I'm a chapter leader with Progressive Democrats of America, um, so I represent Northampton in the 2nd Congressional District in Massachusetts, and I was the uh, Hampshire County Coordinator for the Bernie Sanders campaign. So um, the single-payer concept, if, if the humanity of the wonderful and very moving um, stories, and not wonderful, but just you know, uh, really explain very well. If that doesn't really move you, I want to also just add that it's such a practical system. It's simplistic, it's efficient, mm -hmm. it's pro-business, um, and so it's sustainable for the long term. Um, so if you're not one to really, you know, lean toward be pulled by your heartstrings. Um, it, it really is a very rational um, uh, uh, approach uh, to health care. So it will save lives, um, and that's the most important thing, obviously. Um, but it will save us trillions of dollars. Um, and I just want to say that if you've listened to the propaganda about the long lines in Canada and no op not getting to, you know, have, have the doctor of your choice and all of that, it really is simply propaganda. So I hope you've all had an opportunity to really do some research and, and, and get the facts straight. And thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Good evening. I'll be very quick as well. My name is Hari Kumar. I live on 22 Mountain Laurel Path in Florence. Um, I want to make two points. Um, one is that there are a few different articles out in the New York Times and in the Nation about how, you know, is now the time to think about single payer or other, other systems, some skepticism about Medicare for all. 
What I'd like to say to that is actually now is the time to have that exact debate and to move this bill out of committee so that we as a state can have that debate openly. There are uh, lots of different um, complexities to this and uh, the right place to have that discussion is openly in legislature uh, with our elected representatives actually getting all the information. Uh, the second point I want to make <laughs> is uh, in response to that thing about propaganda. Um, we're going to get hit with a lot of that. Um, this idea that somehow Medicare for all or single payer is going to lead to lots of inefficiencies and you know uh, lack of choice and so on. I'd like to say just personally, uh, I'm I just switched jobs, and just having to negotiate the different insurance plans and realizing that I have to now go through and figure out can I see the doctor that I used to see before? Can my kids see the doctor that they used to see before? That problem is even more magnified under our current system um, than under Medicare for All. So just to push back on that propaganda and to urge you all to say, let's have this debate. Let's actually get our legislators to move this bill out of committee. Thank you so much. Twice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Carolyn Toll Oppenheim. I live at Three Montview Avenue, Northampton, and 99% of what I would have said has been said, so I will not repeat it. Um, I have a family in Canada who came over as refugees from Eastern Europe in the late 60s and they tried to get into this country first and were refused and we don't I won't go into the politics of that but they luckily got into Canada they tell me now that they are so grateful you know they were <laughs> devastated they were devastated at the time because they wanted to be with us and our relatives they were in Montreal and Toronto and <coughs> they've had now they're older they're my generation they they have kids and grandkids They've had a lot of med uh, medical problems, as older people do, and they have not had long lines. They have gotten appointments. Things are efficient, and they don't go through the headaches and the fear that we do um, here. I have a person in my life who's been a single mother for the last few years, and family's been helping her, and she got her degree. She was on Mass Health. She just got her degree and she's starting a job in a school system. Now she won't be able to get mass health. But what she's finding out is that the cost of the insurance is going to make it hard to live on her teacher pay. So, you know, when we hear about um, former military people coming over here who, have, who are on food stamps, um, I recognize that there are lots of industries where people have jobs, and th these are people, you know, we say, oh, they're corporations, but there's people with jobs in those corporations who will lose those jobs if we go to this system, and that will have to be worked out. This, it should be a serious debate and not just <coughs> on a moral high horse. People will get hurt, but in the long run, we have to work out a way that doesn't hurt people. So. Just throw my two cents in. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. I'm going to ask the administrative assistant to call the roll, please. Councillor Bidwell? Here. Councillor Carney? Present. Councillor Dwight? Here. Councillor Klein? Here. Councillor LaBarge? Present. Councillor Murphy? Here. Councillor Nash? Here. Councillor O'Donnell? Here. Councillor Shara? Here. Okay, we have a quorum. In fact, everyone's here, and we will convene this meeting. Um, just for folks who want to remain, uh, we have <coughs> a schedule right now for a poll petition, um, but then at following that, we could probably skip right to the resolution discussion, given the fact that I'm guessing pretty much everyone's here for that. So rather than make you sit in these very comfortable seats for a very long time, We'll bump that up the agenda. So if you want to stick around for that, I'd say about 10 more minutes. Um, we have a public hearing regarding uh, National Grid poll petition for Elm Street at St. John's Church, and this is in accordance with the provisions of Section 22, Chapter 166 of the Mass General Laws. A public hearing will be held on the petition of National Grid to erect poles and wires 
along under or across Elm Street at St. John's Church location. I'll accept a motion to open the public hearing. Make a motion. Second. Second. All those in favor of opening the public hearing, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So we'll start with proponents. Is there a proponent here for the National Grid Poll Petition? Oh, come on. <laughs> No? Out in the hall. Is there someone from National Grid here sitting in the back, maybe? They're out in the hall, maybe. They're out in the hall. Could someone check to see yeah. if there's. Otherwise. Is there someone from National Grid back there? No. No. Well, they're always late, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not in this setting. I move to continue the public hearing. Mm -hmm. Motion's made to continue the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of continuing the public hearing to a later date to be determined. All say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Boom. There goes that public hearing. So I will announce uh, item 17.363. This is another poll petition, but this is uh, also received from National Grid. And this is concerning Art Street, and this is just an announcement of public hearing, once again in accordance with the provisions of Section 22, Chapter 166 of the Massachusetts General Laws. A public hearing will be held here at 212 Main Street, Northampton, 705, on uh, September 7, 2017, on the petition from National Grid to erect poles and wires upon, along, under, or across Art Street in Florence. So mark your calendar, National Grid. Um, <laughs> So we'll bump up in the agenda, as I said, we'll move up to uh, item A under resolutions. This is uh, R-17.372. This is a resolution in support of the bill, uh, Senate Bill 619, and it's an act establishing Medicare for all in Massachusetts. It'll be a first reading. And, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, come on. <laughs> Do you want mine? No. Hang on a second. I got bumped. When things go wrong, let's try this again. Waiting for the internet to work. Do you want mine, Bill? Yeah, it looks. Oh, Safari so can't open the page. Yeah, let's let's. Can I have your print copy then? Mine just came up. Got it. Thank you, Lisa. All right. This is in the City Council, August 17th, in year 2017. This is upon the recommendation of Councilor Lisa F. Klein, Councilor William H. Dwight, and Councilor Maureen T. Carney. <clears throat> it's a resolution in support of Senate Bill 619, an act establishing Medicare for all in, in Massachusetts. And whereas access to affordable quality health care is a human right and a fundamental component of a decent and just society, and whereas the United States remains one of the few countries in the world that does not fully support that right by offering universal publicly funded health care to its residents, and whereas the rapidly rising cost of health coverage and the shifting of health care costs to the insured in the form of co-pays, deductibles, and co-insurance force many Massachusetts residents to defer care for conditions that benefit from early diagnosis, treatment, and, <coughs> excuse me, and whereas Massachusetts families face a high burden of health care costs relative to their income, and whereas the rising prices of prescription medications forces many to choose between filling their prescriptions and making ends meet, and whereas the City of Northampton projects a cost of more than $11 million for employees and retiree uh, health insurance for FY 2018, representing 12.6 percent of the City's $93 million municipal budget, and projects those costs to rise 4 percent annually for the next three years increasing the tax burden on local taxpayers, and whereas the continued rise in cost of employer-paid health insurance negatively affects our local economy by forcing businesses and municipality, municipalities to reduce staffing levels, defer raises, and hire part-time workers, and whereas health care providers must navigate a complex insurance landscape and in doing so divert substantial time and resources away from patient care, and whereas corporate profit should have no place in keeping our communities healthy or caring for the sick, and whereas the current health care system results in 31 percent of every health care dollar going to paperwork, CEO salaries, and profits, while Medicare covers 55 million residents and operates with just a 3 percent overhead. And whereas an alternative 
<coughs> medical for all system that provides quality, affordable health care for all would remedy the unfairness and the unevenness and the disparity of the current health care system and advance the three goals of a rational system, increasing access, improving quality, and containing costs. And whereas Medicare for all or single-payer health care is a system that would guarantee medical care, dental care, and eye care for all Massachusetts residents, regardless of income or employment, by simplifying the way we pay for health care, centralizing health care financing and cost control in a single public or quasi-public agency while keeping the delivery of care in private hands. And whereas the Massachusetts Legislature is currently considering an act establishing improved Medicare for all in Massachusetts, that's House Bill 2987 and Senate Bill uh, 619, that is being co-sponsored by 55 members of the House and Senate, including Representative Peter V. Cook, <coughs> and if enacted, would save the city of Northampton <coughs> millions of dollars in em uh, annual employee health, uh, health insurance expenditures and eliminate the need to contribute to city retirees' health insurance. And whereas Massachusetts has always been a leader and an innovator in providing coverage for the quality health care for its people, now therefore be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts remains committed to providing high quality health care to city employees and retirees and to making such health care available to all residents of Massachusetts. And be it further resolved that we support the Improved Medicare for All Bill currently in the Massachusetts Legislature. And be it further resolved that we commend and support State Representative Peter V. Cocott for being one of the petitioners of HB 2987. Be it further resolved that the administrative assistant to the City Council should cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to the Massachusetts Governor Charles Baker, State Treasurer Deborah B. Goldberg, Massachusetts Senate President Stanley C. Rosenberg, Massachusetts Speaker of the House Robert A. DeLeo, uh, and the original sponsors of 619 and HB 2987, Massachusetts Senator. James B. Eldridge, Massachusetts State Representative Denise uh, Garlick, the co-chairs of the Committee on Health Care Financing, Massachusetts Senator James T. Welsh, and Massachusetts Representative Peter V. Cocott, and U.S. Representative Jim McGovern, U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren, U.S. Senator Ed Markey, and Northampton Mayor David Narkowitz. I'll accept a motion. Put this on the motion. Motion's made and seconded. I'll speak to the author of the of the. Of the, of the resolution, <laughs> you can start. Well, I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of this resolution supporting uh, State Senator Jamie Eldridge's Senate Bill 619, an act establishing Medicare for all in Massachusetts. And I'm grateful to Peter Cocott for being a petitioner on the bill. It calls for a universal publicly financed health care system in Massachusetts by establishing a Massachusetts health care trust as a single payer body responsible for the collection and disbursement of funds required to provide health care services services to every resident of the Commonwealth. So now that we defeated, albeit by the slimmest of margins, the grotesquely misnamed Health Care Freedom Act in Congress, it's time for us to be talking about what health care in our towns, our cities, and our country needs to look like. Um, while some might say that we accomplished what we need to with Obama's Affordable Care Act, in truth, it has failed to cover um, a lot of people in this country, and it hasn't had success in controlling rising health care costs. The corporate powers of the health care industry that in essence control health care in this country, if we're perfectly honest, and in Massachusetts, have created a health care system with hundreds of different insurance plans, and people um, spoke to this very eloquently. Um, different rules, different networks, all resulting in bureaucratic requirements that take precedence over actually taking care of people. Uh, currently in the United States, we spend a, a third of our health care dollars on administration, while other countries spend less than half of that and have better health outcomes. One study showed that many hospitals in this country have more billing agents than nurses, and a recent Harvard study found that for every hour of direct patient care, physicians in the U.S. spend two hours on paperwork. And I heard somebody else say 20 percent of their time, but um, this study showed that it was 50 percent. When we begin to prioritize people's well-being over corporate profits, we can change the fact that the United States is the only 
only industrialized nation. People spoke to this as well. Um, thank you for all of your public comment. It was amazing. Uh, the, we're the only industrial, industrialized nation that does not have some form of publicly funded universal health care. Although they look different in different countries, these universal health care systems on the whole spend about half as much on health care per person per year as the United States, yet they have better health outcomes, as I mentioned, and they live longer than Americans. But what's most compelling to me about our need to support a universal publicly funded healthcare system is that healthcare is a fundamental human need, and as such, it's a basic human right. In fact, it's recognized as such by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. To my mind, this must compel us to place it on the forefront of our policy considerations and rise to the task of making accessible quality healthcare a priority and a reality. Because healthcare is a fundamental need, it unites us as a humans, a across race, class, national origin, immigration status, and ethnicity. Access to health care is a matter of basic dignity, equity, and respect for human life that compels us to establish a health care system that is universal and publicly funded, a system that puts people's needs above corporate profit. I can't stress that enough. If we profess to hold truly democratic values, we have to ensure that it's not wealth or power that grants someone access to quality health care, while others who have less status and wealth cannot access the health care they need to be healthy. Um, I want to thank my co-sponsors on the resolution, Councillor Carney and Councillor Dwight, and most especially, I'm really grateful to a number of you here in the audience. Um, members of our community who sent out this clarion call for the need for universal <coughs> publicly funded health care um, and who encouraged me to work with them on this resolution and in this endeavor. Uh, Judy Wish, Dan Murata, Nancy Tulanian from Amherst, Lindsay Sabadosa, Rachel Maori, Debbie Pastrick Clemmer, Deborah Levinson, and others working with organizations in the Valley um, on this issue. So thank you all for your commitment. Thank you all for your public comment that really, I think, um, said everything that needed to be said. And thank you for your work on a more just society. <clears throat> sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight and for speaking to this really important issue. Thank you, Councillor Klein, for uh, drafting and um, for inviting me to co-sponsor. And um, so much has already been said. I, I don't have a lot to add. The, the resolution itself uh, speaks for itself, and the comments that we heard were just, you know, right across the board um, hit the point. And one thing that I thought of was that um, this has been a long-standing, well, it, it was kind of a debate for a while, and people refer to the fact that they've been dealing with this for the last 20, 30 years. And in <clears throat> my capacity as a labor official as well, it was kind of, t it was not universally accepted, in fact, um, many uh, unions, building trades unions especially, who negotiated these benefits for members really have worked hard at getting these particular benefits and have put them in a, you know, a, at a competitive advantage vis-a-vis um, -vis their, their other non-union contractors and other employers. So it became a difficult issue to convince, but in 2009 the AFL-CIO across the board did support the Medicare for all, sing a single payer health care system. And mostly that was because of the fundamental premise of health care being a, a right and not a privilege to be negotiated as, as a benefit. So there is universal um, backing of this right now in the labor movement as well. And so I, I just wanted to add that piece and thank, again, thank my colleagues for sponsoring this. Any other comments and debate? Uh, Council of Barge? Yes. Um, I'm very happy to see everybody here this evening. Um, Mary Ford, Fran Volkman. If I can recall 20 years ago, this is nothing new. Nothing new to me at all. We spent some of my residents, Freda Robinson, all night long hand doing and painting signs with our Democratic Party out there holding signs 20 years ago for single-payer health insurance. Everybody's in and nobody's out. There's no question about it. Is it time? Yes. 20 years ago, I've been fighting it and still fighting for this. 
the portability, changing jobs, you get divorced, you lose your job, you won't lose coverage. Uniform benefits for everyone, for everyone. Enhances prevention. There's no question about that. Choose your physician. And I heard stories tonight that are absolutely true. I've had it happen on my ward as a counselor where people needed care with cancer and was so worried, very, very worried if they were gonna be able to have that money to pay for what they needed for a good quality of life. This has to be done. We have many representatives and senators who are all involved in this and it is time, Medicare for all, everybody, everybody, single payer for all is a right and health care is a right, not a privilege. Medicare for all, there's no question about it. Everybody's in and nobody's out. Uh, any, anyone else? Uh, Councilor Bidwell. Uh, thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm um, happy to support <coughs> this measure tonight because I believe that health care is an absolutely fundamental human right. I believe that the country all everyone here deserves and requires at some point, hopefully soon, universal coverage. I believe that Massachusetts has the opportunity yet again to play a critical leadership role in getting the nation to universal coverage. Uh, and I do believe, too, that the numbers can work if we take some reasonable and long overdue steps to demilitarize our federal budget. Um, but I, I do have to offer a, 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 a caution, and it's, uh, and it's in part uh, a similar caution as uh, has come in, in recent uh, times, a uh, column by Paul Krugerman, and that is that I think we need to be a little careful about conflating the goal of universal coverage with the way that we get there. And single payer is a way to get there, but I get a little bit worried about talk that it is the way to get there and that I get a little worried about single payer as a litmus test. Uh, I think the experience of nations around the world that have gotten to universal coverage and gotten close to it tell us that based on the facts and circumstances on the ground in different places, it takes different ways to get there. Um, and I think, I think it's a long overdue uh, opening of the conversation <coughs> to get this bill to get out of committee, to fully have the conversation that we need to have and for this uh, state to be a, a leader in getting us to national universal coverage. But I, I, I do have to offer the, 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 the caution about getting too doctrinaire about there being one and only one way to get there when in fact we want to get to universal coverage, but I think it's going to require some flexibility on all of our parts in finding the solution that actually gets us there. So that's my comment. Anyone else? Um, uh, and actually, to your point, uh, Councilor Bidwell, I think it's absolutely right. And the one, one of the point, the one of the more significant points is, of course, the discussion right now is in local chambers. It's on the internet. Houses of legislature of the legislatures throughout the country. There's mumblings. There's no big push. There's no courageous charge to discuss this. So this is where this starts. Um, we're just giving a little push and, you know, and let's recognize the, that we don't wield a lot of weight as far as it goes, but cumulatively as other communities sign on, uh, the hope is that the legislators will be swayed to pull this out of that dusty closet and then start to revisit and discuss this seriously, but also given the context of, of the as, as Councilor Klein pointed out and, and <coughs> others in the testimony tonight, the, the abject failure and the absence of a genuine plan that the Republicans offered for the ACA. Now, the thing, the most compelling reason for me for this is actually the cultural change. It makes a, you've, we've all talked about it in the conversations, a significant cultural change that is for the good. I mean, <laughs> The reason those other countries that actually have this type of universal health care benefit is because they do more prophylactic, pr prophylactic preventative medicine. We're a reactive medical system. 
you spend the bulk of your money r dealing with issues that you had to, that you postponed because uh, principally I'll use diabetes as a perfect example um, in the UK they're as fat as we are they have the same rate of, of uh, type 2 diabetes as we do yet we die at a much higher rate because we're at the reactive stage and we're trying to deal with it and particularly people who can't afford it and that's where diabetes reaps its worst harvest it also culturally changes the the, the functional basis is, as is listed in um, in this resolution about how we conduct business how businesses can actually predicate decisions not based on can they afford to sustain keep their their employees healthy and alive but whether they can keep their businesses viable the focus on that the same thing with the, with municipal governments one of our biggest pressures is trying to accommodate the insurance for existing employees and retirees the, I mean, why we're why we're haggling over that is is absurd because the, in the meantime there are, those things should be a given and should be covered and can be covered easily also as to the point about you know the propaganda issue I mean I've heard the propaganda for a long time it's like having walking around with a really horrible haircut and someone telling you yeah well you should see what they're like in Canada it's completely absurd I mean, it's not it's, it, it, they're making up this kind of easily disprovable fantasy in order to support this kind of and, and we and, and of course we heard it when when the ACA was first being proposed and the uh, um, activists the Tea Party activists in particular who were opposing the establishment of the ACA of course there were going to be death panels there are death panels now there are death panels now there are people whose ability to continue living is actually decided by their ability to afford their health care that's a death panel and people don't even get to testify at that you got no, you just don't get it so this the hope in launching this is to spark the expanded and serious conversation about addressing a profound dysfunction that has a profound deleterious impact on us as a nation politically humanity in, in, in our humanity our our economy I mean every dimension and every aspect is touched by this and it needs us at the very least a serious conversation so thereby I am hoping that uh, people will join me in voting in favor of this resolution now what I'm going to do is I'm going to call for the vote we'll call for a roll call and if this passes it passes in first reading there will be a second reading at our meeting on September 7th just so folks know it's not a fait accompli but the vote should probably give you some indication about the prospects for September 7th as well so uh, any other discussion any points um, John would you call the roll please Councillor Bidwell yes Councillor Carney yes Councillor Dwight yes Councillor Klein yes Councillor LaBarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shaw? Yes. That passes unanimously in first reading. stick around for the rest of the meeting which will, you can see your municipal government at work <laughs> not quite as sexy what you just witnessed but it's well for people who have no lives it's compelling to watch so hey <laughs> I'm, <sorry. laughs> um, I'm gonna wait for the room to clear for folks who want to leave so we we can continue the meeting without interruption <laughs> Twice as many people, but they all went to the uh, civil disobedience training for the to go to the commons. So we're going to jump back on the agenda. Oh, good. Jump back on the agenda. <laughs> we could have had a lot. Yes. <laughs> Thank those Nazis. <laughs> you said good for something. <laughs> At least you give me. You were getting a high sign. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay. Exactly. So back to the business in hand. Um, uh, this is recognition and one minute announcements by counselors. Counselors, you have, anyone have a one minute announcement or anything? Councilor Nash? Oh, where did it go? <laughs> if somebody else has something. <laughs> the way this whole night's going. Does anyone have a one minute announcement handy? No, it's on you, ma'am. I can't bail you out. What's that? Do I need to record the gist of these? No, no. Um, just, yeah, no, no, no. It's not necessary. I'm ready now. Okay, we're ready. So on Sunday, August 20th from 4.30 to 6 p.m. is the fourth annual ice cream social over at Historic Northampton. Uh, it's free and open to the public. Uh, featuring Harold's On the Move ice cream trailer, uh, featuring the, the Florence Community Band, um, and um, people are encouraged to bring their lawn chairs, come and hang out. There will be activities for children, and um, it goes without, uh, and the sponsors are uh, H Historic Northampton, the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association, uh, and the Meadow Cities Conservation Coalition. So show up, get some ice cream, it's a lot of fun. Did you say the day of time again? The day in time it is yes. Sunday, August 20th from 4.30 to oh, 6 p.m. It's this Sunday. This, this Sunday. Sunday. Any other announcements? And the mayor's here, he was able to find a chair. Do uh, you have any proclamations, communications, Your Honor? No, I do not. Okay. Well, we've done the first resolution. The uh, next item is 17.360. This is a resolution supporting the culture of civility in the city of Northampton. And this is the second reading. I'll accept a motion and put it on the floor. Second. Second? Okay. Second. Any further discussion on this point? So this will just be a, a voice vote. So all those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any, uh, any uh, abstentions? Okay, so it's unanimous. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, next. <laughs> um, oh, good. Now we get to, uh, we don't have a presentation scheduled for this section, so we will have presentations coming, but uh, we're going to go, in, we're, if you're watching tonight's meeting, it's very exciting because you're getting a three for one package. <laughs> we're going to have three committees <laughs> competing all in one, and first one, we're going to go to recess, for the Committee on City Services, I pass figuratively the gavel to Councilor Carney, who chairs that committee. Thank you, Councilor. And uh, I will note that the meeting is called to order and ask the administrative assistant, do you have the role for, for this meeting? And if not, uh, while you're looking for that, I will just uh, call the roll then. Uh, Councilor Labarge? Present. Present. Councilor Bidwell? Here. And Councillor O'Donnell. Here. And I am Councillor Carney, as was noted. So I'll ask if there's any public comment before this uh, city services. And seeing none, is there a motion to approve the minutes of July 10th? Let's move approval of those minutes. Are moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And we have just the items referred to committee. Um, from July 13th, we had referred to us an appointment for the Arts Council of Ellen Augarten, and this would be for the term of July 2017 to July 2020 and was a reappointment. And, Councillor? Yes, I had a, a chance to, to, to speak with uh, Ellen Augarten. She's a quite accomplished photographer. She's served several terms on the Arts Council before. By all accounts, she's an invaluable member. Uh, she's very pleased with the makeup of the council, with the good work of the council, with its coordination with other arts uh, organizations. Um, and uh, I enthusiastically recommend that uh, she be reappointed. Is that a motion then? That would be a motion. Did Second. Yes. Okay, moved and seconded for a positive recommendation on the appointment of Ellen Augarten. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And none opposed. That motion carries. And uh, appointment to the Human Rights Commission of Lori Loisel and Councillor O'Donnell. Um, well, Ms. Loisel came before the last council meeting and 
discuss the resolution we just approved. So she's clearly a very active and uh, formidable member of the Human Rights Commission. I'd like to see her back on. So I would move a positive recommendation. And a second? Second. Uh, Moved and seconded a positive recommendation for Lori Loisel to the Human Rights Commission to the full council. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And none opposed, abstentions. And for the Parks and Recreation Commission, we had a nomination of Karen Foster. Yes, Hello. Karen Foster. Um, she's a new appointment. And um, if you looked at her resume, it's unbelievable. Anyway, she originally moved to Northampton in 2004, then moved to a neighboring town in 2007. Then when I bought my first house, that's when she bought it, my family and I just relocated back to Northampton in May as my older son will start kindergarten this fall. And this is the community where we want to raise our kids, and that's, that language was very valuable. I am excited for the opportunity to contribute to the city in any way that I can be helpful, and the Parks and Rec Commission seems like a natural fit. I've been the executive director of All Out Adventures, a Northampton-based nonprofit organization since 2007. We provide outdoor recreation programs to people with disabilities, to seniors, and to veterans throughout Massachusetts. She believes in the physical, mental, and community building potential of recreation. And I'm also interested in reducing barriers to participation in undeserved communities. I have a skill set that includes budgeting, administration, and programmatic oversight, in addition to hands-on skill, experience professionally, and a wide variety of recreation opportunities. And she is just, she feels Northampton is a wonderful place to live, and she's so excited to raise her children here. And she feels that I can, I get that it takes all of us to keep a town or city running well. And I look forward to the opportunity to give back. And I make a positive recommend, recommendation to full city. Second. Okay, moved and seconded to send the name Karen Foster with a positive recommendation to the full council. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that motion also carries. And is there any new business to come before this committee? Then I'll just note that we have a few more appointments. I'll be in touch just about taking care of those for the next meeting in September. And is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. To adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay, so we come out of recess. And the first item is the consent agenda. I would ask that we uh, remove item 17.343 because we were unable to hold a public hearing. So the approval for the poll petition would be out of order. So um, any other amendments or separations on this before I read what the consent agenda will be? Okay. Uh, we have in the consent agenda, we have approve item 16.361. That's appointments based on the recommendations on the Committee of, of City Services, which you just witnessed. And that's, as you heard, Ellen Algarten of 253 Crescent Street uh, here in Northampton, term beginning July 2017, expiring June 2020. It's a reappointment. On the Human Rights Commission, the chair, Lori Loisel, 46 Grant Avenue, Northampton, term uh, to start June 2017, expiring June 2020, and also a reappointment. And then Parks and Recreation Commission, Karen Foster of 155 Grove Street, Northampton, the term to start July 2017, expiring June 2020. And this is a new appointment to filling a, a vacancy. Also, we have uh, item 17.364, this is to approve a secondhand dealer petition for the Mill River Music and, guitar, and Guitars. John Aronstein is the petitioner. Item 17.366, this is appointments to various committees for referral. Uh, to the Committee on City Services. Uh, the, on the Arts Council, we have uh, uh, Melissa Lewis Gentry of 292 and a half South Street in Northampton. Uh, term starting August 2017, expiring June 2020. It's a new appointment, filling the expired term of Eric Olson. And also to the Board of Registrars, uh, Daniel Polachek of 95 Jackson Street, Northampton. This is a term to start August 2017 to expire June 2020. It's a new appointment, filling the expired term of Sandra Hallowell. 
Uh, on the planning board, Alan Verson of 508 Kennedy Road in Leeds, the uh, term starts March 2015, uh, expires June 2018, it's a reappointment. Interesting. Uh, then we also have item 17.371, uh, that's an appointment of Martha Lyon as a historical commission representative to the uh, Community Preservation Committee, that's also a referral to city services, and then also the approval of the minutes from July 13, 2017. Okay. Motions made, is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Oh, look. It's time for another recess. <laughs> and now we, we move down the neighborhood and go to Mr. Murphy's house. And uh, uh, Council Murphy will be presiding. It's, yes. It, Council Murphy will be presiding over the Finance Committee, which will convene. We're off to the Magic Finance Kingdom here. <laughs> I'm going to call a meeting to order, and I'll call, I'll call a roll. Uh, Councilor Nash. Uh, uh, present. Here, President. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Labarge. Present. And I'm, of course, here, so we have a full house tonight. Uh, first item is to approve the minutes of the July 13th meeting. Do we have a motion? No Second. Any discussion on the minutes? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, financial orders. The first one is 17368. This is an order to accept lot four on Earl Street. Um, Village Hill for municipal or other purposes. Order that whereas Hospital Hill Development LLC is offered to donate lot four at Village Hill South off Earl Street at the former Northampton State Hospital. The, the lot is 30,237 square feet shown in plan book 221 page 81 and they're offering to <coughs> Northampton whereas lot has potential for social service, economic development, solar, photovoltaic or other municipal uses, that, uh, therefore order that the City of Northampton is authorized to acquire any fee, easement, and or other interest in the above land. We have a motion finance? So moved. Second. Second. And we have the Mayor to talk about it. Yes, good evening, Councillors. Um, the, um, the parcel in question, if you're, um, if you're at the stop sign on Earl Street and you're looking and you see Volts Clark Associates uh, and then you see the corner of uh, you know, Earl and Grove, uh, there, um, there's a parcel that was part of the former state hospital um, that Mass Development um, acquired as as part of their master development um, agreement, and it's a parcel that they have never marketed. It's sort of undersized. It doesn't have a lot of access, um, and they have no intention of marketing at this point. Um, so um, they have offered to convey it to the city, um, and as the order points out, we don't have a clear end use for it at this point, um, but we have agreed to uh, accept it, obviously with your approval, um, and it has some potential uses in the future. Um, it may be the city may end up just conveying it to someone else or selling it to someone else, but we, um, we, we agreed uh, to work with Mass Development to acquire the property. So that's what this order would allow us to do, would be able to accept it. And again, it's, it's being conveyed to us for no consideration. Questions? No questions. Yes. Uh, yes, Mayor. Um, it says 30,237 square feet. So how much is that? How many acres? Three fourths. What is it? Three about quarters three quarters or so? Yeah, three quarters of an acre. Thank you. You're uh, Any other questions, math or otherwise? <laughs> Hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 Again, that's in finance. Uh, the next is 17, or no, is 17369. And that is an order to authorize the purchase of 55 acres on East Hampton Road, Route 10, and Old Wilson Road for conservation, municipal, and other purposes. Order that whereas the Open Space and Recreation Plan 2011 to 18 recommends expanding open space near both the Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary and the for former Northampton State Hospital and collaborating with Mass Audubon. And whereas the owners of land along East Hampton and Old Wilson Roads have agreed to sell, uh, particularly 2.73 acres for $20,000, now are formerly owned by Judith O'Brien, 47.41 acres for $150,000, now are formerly owned by Wilson Realty, and five acres for no monetary consideration, also owned by Wilson Realty. Uh, whereas a five 
acre portion of the property is appropriate for economic development, solar, photovoltaic, or other municipal uses, whereas the remainder of the land is available uh, as valuable wildlife and plant habitat linkage between Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary and the Connecticut River floodplain with Rocky Hill Greenway and the former Northampton State Hospital and other upland areas, whereas the Mass Audubon Society has committed to fund 81000 for the purchase price and to hold the necessary <coughs> conservation restrictions at no cost to the city, and whereas the remainder of the funding will come from the Community Preservation Act, other grants, community contributions, and other city appropriations, order that the mayor is authorized to accept a deed or deeds to the above referenced five acres for economic development, solar voltaic, or other municipal uses. Um, further, the Conservation Commission is authorized to purchase or otherwise acquire for conservation and passive recreation purposes as provided in Mass General Law Chapter 40, subsection 8C, any fee easement conservation restriction as defined in M MGL Chapter 184, <coughs> subsection 31, or any interest in the remainder of the above reference land and any immediately adjoining land with such related restrictions and agreements as the city determines are agreeable. Further, the City Council hereby accepts such conservation restrictions. Further, the Conservation Commission is authorized to grant conservation restrictions on any land so acquired. Do we have a motion in finance? Second. 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 And I'm actually going to, um, I'll ask Mr. Fiden to come up and uh, because this is uh, uh, a series of different things going on, I want to have him explain it um, and especially the, the, um, the land conservation piece of it. So in your package, I don't know if you can get it back, John, on the screen. Um, You've authorized us to purchase um, the Rocky Hill Greenway over the last few years, and so we now have a large conservation area that's there. Uh, that area butts up against the state hospital, open space land, um, and it's sort of across Route 10 from Mass Audubon's property. So this is a key linkage between the two um, parcels, so a lot of wildlife opportunities. It's currently zoned business park but between very steep slopes and vernal pools, it's not really developable. So we're never going to see a business park no that's sewer. there. And no sewer. Um, uh, so the plan is for most of the property to come to conservation, the land that's undevelopable. There's a five-acre parcel, and the reason the, the resolution, the order is so open-ended is we don't know exactly what use it could be. It's a very steep access from Route 10, so it's difficult to get to, but then there's a flat plateau on it. And this idea is basically to land bank it to see what the opportunities are. Um, frankly, it's, it's, if the property to the south gets developed, then that five acres might be very developable. If the property to the south doesn't get developed, it's probably not, because the parcel to the south would have to build a, a driveway access that we could share. They would have to build a sewer line to hook into East Hampton, and then suddenly the five acres is usable. So we would sort of hold the five acres. If nothing ever came up, we probably could use it for sol solar photovoltaics, and otherwise, you know, it would have to come before you all, but we could look at other uses for it. So the rest of the land would be preserved. Mass Audubon is our partner on this. They'd be paying, in essence, 50% of the purchase price, except for that five acres, which would be up to us. And they'd be holding the conservation restriction, which usually we have to pay about $20,000 for a stewardship fee for someone else to help hold it. So it's $81,000 plus save $20,000. Councilor LaMarche. Yes, um, Wayne, on the mapping, it shows the Pine Grove Golf Course. Now, the Pine Grove Golf Course is on Wilson Road, correct? So where does that affect this? So it's sort of the height of the land. If you come in off of Route 10, okay. um, and or, I'm sorry, Route 5, and climb up, Ten. You come off Route 10 and climb up, there's sort of a high point, and the land that drains down to um, East Hampton Road is the land we'd be acquiring. The land that's sort of flat and drains down to Old Wilson Road, that's the land that's owned as part of the golf course. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, the conservation restriction, under whose aegis? So that'd be Mass Audubon Society. Mass Audubon Society. We grant it to them, correct. Okay. Fine. I'm just um, curious about the, this is on the other side of Route 10 from um, Arcadia, right? That's correct. And so if we're talking about wildlife, is there, are we 
kind of increasing any issues with animals crossing the road and creating hazards and risking their lives and I mean how is that how does that figure in when you think about kind of expanding a parcel <coughs> major thoroughfare right. right in the middle of it? So I mean it's absolutely right. I'm sure there are some animal kills along the road. They're already crossing right now. I mean obviously what we're doing is protecting more of that corridor that's out. Um, but yes there are gonna be some uh, you know auto strikes of animals there. Um, but the, I mean the animals are these are animals that want to cross so they're gonna cross anyway. So having as wide a corridor as possible makes it safer. On the east side of the road it's a very thin parcel you see that the city already owns that's sort of part of the buffer between National Audubon and East Hampton Road, and there's two additional parcels there. So we're making it, we're preserving more of the corridor, but you're absolutely right, that's an issue. Is there a way to create some kind of barrier, or is that done to keep animals from kind of getting into the roadway, going into the roadway? Um, there are, I mean, the incredibly expensive ways of bridges and tunnels. Um, certainly people who put fences up, <laughs> channel, you know, if there was one spot was particularly good line of sight, people do put up fences to sort of channel animals in that direction. Um, you know, the biggest strike out there, auto strike is probably deer, and deer can jump a pretty high fence. So it's going to be hard to stop that from happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so Bidwell. Uh, I, I, I know this is the area of the city where there's been talk about the possibility of a, of a new business park down the road. It's always been highly problematic because of sewer and divided uh, divided ownership and slope and everything. Would this officially put that uh, to rest, any, any, any talk of a business park? It, it would. So what we did, um, or what you all did, we recommended a few <laughs> years ago, is we looked carefully at this area and we made some changes. So the, the Raymond property, which is just south of this, used to be zoned business park. As you said, one of the challenges is land assembly. So you all rezone that from business park to office and or to general industrial. Um, and you rezone what's now um, Sunnyside from whatever, from a residential district to, I'm not even sure what it is now. Yeah. So they do sort of, those are the areas that's developable. We will be coming back to you, you're not obligated to approve this, to rezone the five acres to match the Raymond property. So that's the, that's the development corridor which we think and is realistic. Raymond to the, s to the south here? That's correct. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so really what's developable out there realistically is five acres of Raymond, seven acres of Raymond, and five acres of this parcel. Um, the, the only, I mean, even going back 20 some odd years when this is zoned business park, the only way it was really realistic was first of all major grants to, to pay for infrastructure, but also a multi-story building. Imagine what you see in California where someone's willing to build a five-story office <coughs> building buried in a hillside. That's not the market we see. The market here is one and two-story <coughs> buildings on flat sites that Gat would drive. And so it just doesn't really work for this site. Right. Um, yeah, and even as it is, I mean, we may come before you. We're working with Raymond to think about other, other opportunities to, because you know, that property's been on the market now for 15 years. Are there other rezonings that make sense to get that developed? That one we definitely don't want for open space. We want it developed for some economic development. Council uh, Bark, did you have another question? No, I don't. Anybody over here? Have a question? I actually have a question, and it, it's we talked about this when we did the uh, whatever we call this, the swamp off Birds Pit Road that we took <coughs> and cut off some buildings, but these. These properties that we're taking are tax valued at pretty close to eight hundred thirty thousand dollars and generate pretty close to fourteen thousand dollars a year in property taxes. Now the good news is that won't go away. The bad news is the rest of us split it up and and pay for it, and that's like fourteen thousand dollars every year forever. Um, so we're starting to not take back land and land that is undevelopable and land that you know, really doesn't have an impact on the tax base. And we're starting to shift, every time we do one of these, we shift the burden of the taxes that were supplied by these pieces of property to the remainder of the tax base. And, you know, we've got most of the land that's really truly undevelopable. So now we're starting to nibble away at things that, that 
raise the tax burden of the remaining property taxpayers. So and is there any way to address that? I know at the Great Swamp, we created some building sites to kind of offset it. Right. Here, w you know, what are we doing to recoup the 14 grand so it doesn't land on everybody else? So I think there's two answers to that. The first is everything you said is absolutely true theoretically. But if the owner of that property came before the assessors tomorrow and share the assessment that we've done and they've now done, the reason they're willing to sell it to us at such a low price is that land isn't really developable. So it's, it's over-assessed at, at this point. So they really could come back in tomorrow and say, you know, we've marketed this for 10 years and the highest and best offer we had was for $150,000 to sell the property and that's probably what it's worth for doing it. They haven't done that as part of this deal, frankly, because I suspect they're going to try to get a tax deduction for the difference between what we pay um, and what it shows on our books. But I don't think it has that value there. So they could lower it. And then as you say, similar Burt's Pit Road, that's why we're carving out that five acres of land. We would very much like the five acres to get developed. I don't think, and I can't speak for you or the mayor, I don't think we want that five acres to maximize city revenue when we sell that lot. We'd love to find somebody who wants to create a building that pays taxes and jobs. So if there's development value, we will recapture it in that five acres. So, but the money still gets shifted because they were paying the taxes. It gets shifted because they were paying the taxes, but it'll get equally shifted if tomorrow they filed an abatement. If they got an abatement, yeah. so. Any other questions? Councilor. Well, two. Councilor Murphy's point, is there any such animal or could there be, um, when you put land into conservation, it goes tax-free, essentially, but could you have, um, could you have a mechanism, you know, sometime in the, in the magical future where the tax is somehow phased out over a period of time, you know, so you still provide an incentive to people to put things into conservation, but it strikes kind of a balance. So what we do quite regularly, and you all approve these, is when property is in working land, someone's actively keeping it in forestry or uh, agriculture, our goal is generally not to buy those properties, to keep them as open space, and we just buy a restriction on them. And that's in essence what that does. That means we're lowering the taxes to its current use value. So it's in essence the same as if a person went to Chapter 61. So if this doesn't work in this property because this is sort of a junk forest left out. It, this site was clear cut when the interstate was built and they took borrow out to build the interstate. So it's a low grade forest. But there's other places in the city where people are either farming it or they're keeping it as in essence a tree farm. And that's exactly what we try to do is we keep it in private hands. We still get not development value taxes, but some taxes. I think sort of the way you're describing it. This doesn't really have that kind of value that's out there. Yes, I guess I was kind of just like using my imagination like that taught me in kindergarten. So yeah, <laughs> no, I, I realize you probably can't do that, but just what Councilor Murphy brought up seemed interesting. Thank you. Any other questions? Then uh, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 And I'm going to oppose. Uh, next thing <coughs> we have is uh, an order to pay a prior year bill. This is 17373. Uh, be it ordered that the City Council authorizes the payment of prior fiscal year bills. This is from 2017 related to the Fire and Rescue Department. Um, one is for computer keyboards for $59.98 and um, one for two swivel back stools for $139.98 and these appear to be paid to Amazon.com. Do we have a motion in final? Second. Second. Any questions for the mayor on this one? There are bills that were from the prior fiscal year. No questions? All in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? No. The next is 17, uh, 374. This is to accept a $4,000 donation uh, to purchase and install some benches. Order that the City of Northampton, the City Council, gratefully accepts a donation of $4,000 from the Florence Civic and Business Association for the purchase and installation of three benches and the donation of three concrete bench pads 
from Look Park valued at $450 as gifts to the City of Northampton for the Trinity Row Park. Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 53. Do we have a motion to finance? Make a motion. Second. Second. All right. Any comment from the mayor on this one? Just that the city's been uh, collaborating with the Florence Business and Civic Association um, uh, for several years to um, to remodel that park, uh, built a new fountain, and um, and so now we're working with them on a sort of a final landscaping. So they've graciously donated, along with Look Park, these benches. So it's fairly straight. And straight. Any other questions? I'm hearing none. All in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> and now it's time for the ever patient Susan Wright to give us our final quarterly financial report from last year. of the financials in your packet okay so this is a report of the fourth quarter um, which would be the ending <coughs> quarter of FY 17 um, so it's kind of um, it, this is not completely finalized our independent auditors Tom Scanlon is here doing the audit and there are always some audit adjustments but in general this um, sums up the year everything in all of the general fund and the enterprise funds um, there's nothing remarkable uh, all of our projections seem to come in pretty much where we thought they would, and um, there was some healthy turnbacks um, in salaries, particularly whenever there's a vacancy, there's salary money turned back. Um, so I'll start first with the general fund. Um, the revenues for the general fund ended the year um, with a surplus of 1719407 Last year in fiscal 16, we ended with 1.4 million, so it's slightly up. Um, this is where we generate the free cash that is used to do a lot of the capital plan. Some of the areas that um, had more, uh, came in higher than was originally estimated, we had about 50,000 more in tax titles that were paid. So these are properties that were in tax title and they finally came to either they sold or, or they finally paid back their back taxes. Uh, ambulance revenues were um, up a lot um, over prior years. Uh, last year, ambulance revenues were approximately 1.6 million, and this year they were almost 1.9 million. So it was almost two, it was $270,000 more than last year in ambulance revenues. Uh, part of that is we have switched billing services, um, according to John Garropy, that the billing service has done a better job than the prior one, um, but also the call volume is up, so there's, there's two reasons for that. Um, the rest of the um, revenues in the general fund performed as expected. We did have one area that we did see a drop in, which was Medicaid reimbursement for the schools, and that's because the rules surrounding school reimbursement for Medicaid services are changing. And so things that had formerly been eligible are no longer eligible. So this is an area that when I um, work on setting the tax rate for 2018, I'll probably reduce that um, estimate that we put in the budget for 18. But overall, revenues were 102% um, of, our, our, of our estimates. So the 1.7 million, although it sounds like a lot, is actually only 2% above what we anticipated. And we like to try to somewhat underestimate um, revenues because you never know what's going to happen with state aid and, and other areas. So this is a good financial practice. Um, as far as the general fund, uh, th this the statement that you have does not include the two school departments. Both school departments fully expend their appropriation. They do, do not turn money back to the city, so theirs are zero. So I didn't include their um, financials in this. But the city, uh, all the general fund, which would be all the city's departments, um, turned back $1.9 million. Um, the general fund spent 97%. So again, it sounds like a big number, but it's basically 3% surplus. The bulk of that was through salaries from vacant positions. And um, there's really nothing to point out there. I will say, though, the legal services budget 
uh, came in the lowest it has been in six years. So that was good. Um, it was only 170,000, so we returned 105 of that budget back to the, the general fund, which was good. Um, other, if you look through this, some of the uh, the fire and the police department you'll see have returned some um, large amounts, but of course vacancies in those positions take a while to fill, and that's why um, sometimes there's quite a bit of PS turned back. Um, so overall, um, we returned to the general fund for OM and PS about 200,000 less than the year before. So both of those will be good numbers that should show up when we get free cash certified in the fall. Now in terms of the, gener uh, the enterprise funds, uh, there's really nothing to talk about there. All of the revenues came in as expected. Um, the sewer revenue came in about 62,000 more than was anticipated, which was a little under 1%. Water revenue came in um, a little higher, about 4% more than we anticipated. Stormwater revenue um, came in at 99.2, so it came in just about 15,000 under what we had estimated. And solid waste uh, came in um, about where we estimated, about 3% more. So overall, the revenues are on track. And again, with the enterprise funds, the only trend that I would note in a comparison to last year is that all of the enterprise funds um, actually spent full, more fully expended their funds this year than they did the prior year. And I would attribute that to tighter management at the DPW. So, so do you have any questions? about any of these. Any questions? Any questions? Counselor. I have a little question. Okay. Um, I see that there's a 2200 revenue from uh, reimbursement from the five colleges for the PVTA. And I'm just curious with all of the stuff in the news about the cutting of the budget of the PVTA, I'm wondering um, with that revenue, is there has that can that be applied in some way to um, expand routes, continue routes between uh, Northampton and the five colleges? Uh, that reimbursement is a general fund revenue, and it's basically the five colleges reimbursement to the city um, for running additional routes. I believe. Yeah. So the PBTA has agreements with all the member communities. Um, uh, with the five colleges and basically the five colleges say um, we want you to add extra service in Amherst and we want you to add extra service um, in Northampton wherever it is and then they pay um, to because we actually get anytime there's a transit authority service in a community we're assessed it's, it's assessed off of our cherry sheet so they make a they make a donation to offset that um, so, you know, the routes that we're talking about, what we're talking about here is for FY17. Going forward into FY18, I know that PBTA um, is currently in discussions with um, the five colleges about those agreements and whether five colleges would be wanting to contribute more, say, for example. Um, but there's no, there's no surplus or anything left over. This is actually just what they paid to run the routes for FY17. The, the changes are happening um, actually starting right now in FY18. So, um, yeah, that's, that's sort of how it works. Right, and we estimated that we would get 69,000 from five colleges, and we ended up with 71,222, so about 2,000 higher. That, uh, those two and three percent uh, above estimate, Buffers, you feeling good about that? Obviously, it's better than anything that's below. But right, I mean, you don't want you don't want it to be you don't want it to be large because right. then because you would have really over budgeted. Yeah. So you know, I think I think we budget accurately. We fully budget for every position in the city. So I anticipate a surplus every year, at least in salaries, because we budget for every position. We don't say, oh, we normally have a ninety, you know. 5% vacancy rate, so we're going to budget less. We budget for every position in the city, so and it takes a while to fill. So it's it's good. You want to, you know, rule of thumb is you want to try to generate up to 5% um, in, in turnbacks because that's what's going to give you the free cash that you need to do, you know, to have as a reserve. To her point about public safety, we just had, I think, three officers uh, leave to go to the state police. So that means they we're were poached, by the way. 
Yes. <laughs> but, but, you know, so those will be fully budgeted positions that will now be vacant for two, three, four, five, six months. Um, and that happens throughout the year. It happens in the fire department. Um, we <coughs> have been having a lot of retirements in the fire department. So you have people that are, you know, 40 year members who retire, and then we hire a brand new one. So then the, there's salary savings. Salary there. So. And, and that's why it doesn't make sense sometimes to just look at, say, in, in public safety, the overtime budget, because the overtime budget could be large because of vacancies, but then there's corresponding, you know, savings in salary line items. That's never represented on paper other than a, a, a turn back. Right. Number, right. Councilor right. Uh, Bidwell. Uh, yeah, Susan, I, I, I looked at the reports briefly. I'm sorry, I don't have them in front of me. I, I didn't look at the hotel and meals. I'm just curious what, what, what trends you're seeing on, on those. They're, they're um, about the same as they were last year. Um, uh, ho hotel Motel um, was within a half a percent of last year's revenue, and uh, Meals was down a little bit, about 3% from last year. But overall, together, they were within 20,000 of the prior year. So, And some of that can be timing, just the payments that come from the state. Any other questions on the, the report? Then thank you. And that was the last thing on finances agenda. So uh, is there any unexpected or new business that anyone has? Hearing none, then a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So we're coming back out of recess and what the hell since we've got a thing going on with recesses let's take a brief recess so stretch your legs or whatever it is you do during the recess we're going to recess <coughs> for eight and two-thirds minutes <laughs> sounds like a pretty film <laughs> two-thirds minutes that's 40 seconds
And we're back. Um, we're coming out of recess and we'll get back to the order of business. Um, now that we've come out of finance, the first order is, of course, a financial order. Item 17.373. This is an order authorizing the payment of a prior year bill. I'll accept a motion. Second. Motion made and seconded. And if I can ask counselors when they, when they move things to do it loud enough so that um, John can keep a pace of this. Pam got to, Pam could got to the point where she could sense who was making the motion, but for John's benefit, I think, just speak your motion loud enough and then your second loud enough and. We should get paddles. <laughs> I'm considering, yes, you get little paddles, that would, that would be fun. Uh, so, all right, the motion's made and seconded. Any further discussion on this item? Uh, this will require a roll call, John, so. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. All right, that passes in first reading. Next item is 17.374. This is an order to accept the donation of $4,000 for the purchase and installation of benches. And this is the first reading. Is there a motion? motion. What's that? First Second. <laughs> very much. <laughs> Council LaBarge made the motion. Council Shara seconded it. Uh, any discussion? All right, John. Roll call, please. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. All right, that passes in first reading. Now we come up to orders, <coughs> and of course this one, actually the first item is going to be uh, involve a discussion and presentation um, from Mr. Fiden, and the item number is 17.354. And this is in order to endorse the Walk Bike Northampton Citywide Pedestrian and Bicycle Comprehensive Plan from 2017. This will be the first reading. And let me read you the order. This is okay. This is in uh, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, the Planning Board, Transportation, Parking Commission, and Planning and Sustainability. This is in order to endorse the Walk Bike Northampton Citywide Pedestrian and Bicycle Hub Comprehensive Plan. And ordered that whereas the City Commission Alta Planning Plus uh, designed to write. Uh, the Walk Bike Northampton Citywide Pedestrian and Bicycle Comprehensive Plan 2017 with extensive community participation, hearings, and workshops. And whereas the plan provides a comprehensive examination of making bicycling and walking safe and desirable on all surface streets and helps the city plan for future improvements and policies. And whereas on January 12, 2017, the Planning Board adopted the Walk Bike Northampton as an element in the City Comprehensive Plan. And whereas on March 21st, 2017, the Transportation Parking Commission endorsed the Walk Bike Northampton and recommended the City Council also endorse the plan. And whereas the City Council endorsement does not imply agreement with every single recommendation, but it is an endorsement of the process and priority for making walking and biking and bicycling safer, in order that the City Council endorses Walk Bike Northampton Citywide Pedestrian and Bicycle Comprehensive Plan 2017. Now I'll accept a motion. Second. Uh, Council LaBarge and Councilor Bidwell seconded. Okay. Uh, discussion, or actually, why don't we just cut to the chase and have Wayne give his presentation? Okay, thank you. And I'll add this one before the Committee on Community Resources, who voted in favor of recommending you adopt this unanimously at their July meeting. So I'll try to run through this quickly. You have a paper copy of this presentation as well as it's up there. So, um, you all know that we have a comprehensive plan, which was adopted about nine and a half years ago. We begun looking at the plan, figuring that after 10 years we should come back and revise the plan. So next January we start, we hope to kick off a public process of adopting the plan. In the meantime, we went through, you all remember we went before the STAR Communities, which is this nationwide assessment of how sustainable are we. So we went through the STAR community process. We were the top-ranked community in the country that's been through the process of the 40 communities who've done it. And, but we used that process to look at our comprehensive plan and figure out what was strong and what was weak, what are the areas we need to focus on. And there were two things that came out of the process we want to focus on. Um, 
pedestrian and bicycle access, so that's the reason we did this plan, and then a climate change element, and so that's the reason the mayor funded <coughs> you all approved some money in capital. So you'll be seeing the climate change part coming before you later. Um, so that's why we, so this is now a standalone plan, although we hope to incorporate this in the comprehensive plan when it comes back before you. So I just want to go through quickly and give some background on this process. So, you know, it's funny, having been here forever, you notice that sort of a, a paradigm shift, a sea change, sneaks up on you. So when I was hired for the city, before most of you were born, um, the city had just started the redesign of King Street, or just started implementing redesign of King Street. And King Street was redone without a single pedestrian uh, signal on the entire street, except for on Main Street, the Main Street intersection. We would never do that now. So it's, so you know, these things, we don't notice how, how much we've evolved over the years. But what you all accept is, of course, we put pedestrian crossings, and of course, we focus on pedestrians. It wasn't really done as recently as 1987. Um, and if you imagine going back to the 70s and 60s and 50s, there was sort of a 30-year year period where very little was done for bicycles and pedestrians. For the last 20 years, the city has done an enormous amount. So when people talk about we still have one fatality a year from either bicyclists or pedestrians on the average. You got to realize that there's 30 years of doing, not only doing nothing, but doing w wrong things that we've been making up for 20 or 30 years, but just it's hard to do that. So, this is sort of the next step in the process. So, this is just sort of, it was interesting for me looking through this process of the history. And we've actually been a leader in a lot of ways. I mean, even that period where we didn't put pedestrian signals on King Street, we put concrete sidewalks the entire length of King Street up to Damon Road. Lot, I mean, I was here, it was as little as 10 years ago, when the Hadley Selectman said, we will not allow new sidewalks on Route 9 going through Hadley. We don't think people should be walking there. So we were 40 years ahead of that, but you know, there's still a lot of catch up to do. So this sort of list of things here, part of the story that I tell is um, when that paradigm started changing, when we started thinking about pedestrians, it was at Stop and Shop. So Stop and Shop was building a gas station there and the gas station paid us some traffic mitigation. And we got two things. We had a bike path through Stop and Shop, and they agreed to pay for the signal, the pedestrian signal. Remember, there was no signal before. But we didn't have enough money, and we went after the community and did fu community fundraising for a pedestrian phase at Stop and Shop. The reason that stands with me is this is about as unsexy a thing as you can imagine, right? You don't have bake sales so we can hire an engineer to design a traffic signal. But in fact, we raised, I think it was $10,000, and this is 15 years ago, and $10,000 was real money. Um, and that was sort of a clear message from the community that we wanted to do a lot. There was you know, a, a mayor's committee on safe streets, and, and that's in some ways how our current mayor got sort of a lot of his early political steps, is sort of building that constituency towards safety. You all have been involved, so I'm, I don't want to preach to the choir. But at each step, we're sort of moving along the process, and I think it's important to keep doing it. We as a city have done an enormous amount of really good things. Um, we're in some ways not trying to change the things we do, but try to formalize it, have a clearer set of rules that we all know. So we, in 2005, adopted, we being you and the mayor, adopted a series of complete street policies in the 2008 plan. We did a complete streets policy, a formalized complete streets policy. Last year, you all adopted a complete streets ordinance. We're one of the few cities in the Commonwealth that has an ordinance which has a lot of teeth to say we really mean all this stuff. Um, and we, we're now used as an example. You know, Federal Highway just asked me to take part in a webinar last week um, presenting on how do you do crosswalk safety. So we and two or three other towns around the country were sort of the, the step, you know, the, the stories of what we're doing. So we're doing lots of great things in the process. Um, <coughs> sorry, this slide's a little bit washed out, but just sort of walking you through the steps. So you still see some of these things today. We do what's called tactical urbanism, or community demonstration projects. So things like the parklet in front of City Hall or the Amber Lane parklet. Um, or the demonstration, which washed out here, is the demonstration project that we did last year where we narrowed Main Street for a day on a Saturday to see how it could work. All those things are really good at sort of getting people to visualize what you all say, how it is we can make the street safer um, in different ways. And then we do a lot of things. Again, these you all know, but if you went to 
300 towns in Massachusetts out of, out of 352, you'd find that more of the number is. You'd find that most don't do this. So I just, I want to walk you through a few of the things we do quickly. We used to say, and most communities do this, that a driveway is owned by the cars. So pedestrians should stop at the driveway. We've changed our rules about six or seven years ago to say, no, we want the sidewalk to cross the driveway. If the sidewalk's concrete, we want it to be concrete where it crosses the driveway. If the sidewalk is six inches higher than the road, we want the, the driveway crossing to be six inches higher. And it sends a clear message that the pedestrian owns the sidewalk. They should watch for cars and not get killed. Pedestrians own it, and cars should yield to them. And that's really an important part of the culture, that we're not asking the, the pedestrians to drop down six inches at every sidewalk. We're not changing the materials. It's really part of the pedestrians. Um, likewise, uh, roadway crossings. Thinking about the materials, DPW has adopted a new zebra standard for sidewalks maybe eight years ago. They've widened that standard. They've ad had advanced warning. So we're focused on making them more and more visible. They're slowly retrofitting crosswalks as we go through. So thinking about how to make those things really visible. Thinking about road diets. So you can think, you know, on the, on the bottom right, you see a picture of Prospect Street before. Prospect Street look like a highway speed. And so you drive down Prospect Street at 45 miles an hour. So of course the police will get a lot of calls and have to put a, a police officer out there to enforce the speed limit. DPW then added striped parking and a bike lane. Now that, that's great for bicycles, but it's not the important story in Prospect Street bike lane. It's about narrowing the travel lane, which means cars drive slower. If bicycles use the bike lane, it's great. But if no bicycle ever used the bike lane, it's still really important. So we're doing all these things together. Um, the part that I find a little bit concerning sometimes when I go before the Transportation and Parking Commission is I hear neighbors say, oh, we know that speed bumps work on Jackson Street. We know they work at the state hospital. This is great. We should have speed bumps everywhere in the city. And so part of my message is we can't look at these things in isolation. If you have a speed bump where you expect cars to slow down, it's too late. Right? You hit the first speed bump at 40 miles an hour, and then 200 feet la later, you're going really slow with a pedestrian on your hood. So we need to think about these things as a complete system. You know, a, a perfect example of this is Elm Street. The very first in improvement that Smith College made um, by Paradise Road was a diversion of the road and a speed hump. That's not about making that crosswalk safe. Almost nobody uses that crosswalk. That's about slowing the speed of cars so that when I get to where there were two fatalities in front of now the campus center, the cars are going slow there. So that's part of the system. It's, it's don't start where you want cars to slow down. Start where you want them all. Yeah. So you can think about what we're doing right now on Pleasant Street. We're spending $2.9 million, about a million of that is on the street. 1.9 is buried underground, so that's less obvious. But the million dollars is what you see that's out there. And we thought of this entire system. So we looked at zoning, because we know that people drive slower when you have land use up to the street, when it's more vibrant. We looked at parks. We looked at landscaping. Um, the roundabout down a Con Street is part of the overall piece. Right? This roundabout's not in isolation. It's not one solution. The roundabout is the beginning of the pedestrian safe both Pleasant Street and Con Street. So this is the start of the system. And it was deliberately done. This is the start of knowing we want a gateway into downtown. Um, and so then we did a series of steps. So from Hockman to Holyoke Street, we did a road diet. So we have already narrowed the road by about 10 feet. We put these are called cycle tracks. They're elevated bike lanes. So the bike lanes are six inches higher than the road. So there's a physical separation between the cars and the bike lane. What you don't see yet, I think they're going to do within the next few days, I think maybe on Monday, is the striping. So on Pleasant Street, we're adding another row of parked cars on the west side of Pleasant Street between Hockham and, and Holyoke Street. So that will lower that, that area that used to be almost a 30-foot wide profile is going to be 21 feet wide. So cars, So we want people to park in those parking spots because we want to narrow the street. Again, one of the most effective ways to slow the speed of a road isn't just the vertical deflections like speed humps, it's the horizontal narrowing. We know that really works effectively. So again, I hope that people use these cycle tracks. In some ways, they're a test of the city's first cycle tracks. They've been in Cambridge for 15 years. Um, Boston has a few of them, but they're still relatively new in Massachusetts. I hope they work, but even if they're not used by bicycles, they're important to narrow the street. Again, these are deliberately done before Holyoke Street, because Holyoke is when the pedestrian traffic really begins, right? So you have a crosswalk 
down by where, where A and W used to be by the public health building um, that few people use. But it's really by Holyoke Street you start getting a lot of pedestrian traffic. And so everything we've done up to this point in my slides is to slow traffic down where the first person is actually crossing the street. So then we did a series of things, again, as part of a story at Holyoke and Pleasant, at Short and Pleasant, we have curb extensions. This narrows the street profile down to 21 feet to 10 and a half foot lanes. And these are aggressive. What I, what I want to say is what we've done for a long time is sidewalks that are really great, where we're adding extra stuff, but at some point to really slow down the speed of cars, we have to be taking away some real estate from the cars. So, you know, we already heard people saying, oh, I'm nervous about going through here in my truck. It's a hard turn to make. And it's true, if you're coming down here and turning right in a truck, it's going to be a much slower speed turn. Um, and even if you're in a car, turning right is a slower speed turn. But that's a good thing. Um, I, I sometimes, when there's nobody around, this is just a test, I see how fast can I go around a turn um, into a street without slowing down. And on many of our streets in town, you can go 25 miles an hour without slowing down, without leaving your lane. You shouldn't be making a 90 degree turn at 25 miles an hour, right? We want cars to slow down. There's, a, there's magic numbers people use, but if you get hit by a car at 20 miles an hour, you're probably going to live. If you get hit by a car at 30 miles an hour, you're probably going to die. Right, so you're making a blind curve, 90 degrees in an intersection with lots of pedestrian traffic. That's the place we want to slow down. So curb extensions do this. We also have raised crosswalks here. Um, I want to be clear, these are not speed bumps. Pleasant Street is an emergency route. We don't want trucks to bottom out. So you can go over these raised crosswalks at a pretty fast rate of speed. It's not like a, a speed bump. But what it does do is, again, sends a message that this is the pedestrians own this, not the cars. Doesn't mean pedestrians shouldn't be looking what they're doing, but it sends a clear message to the cars, pedestrians live here. And also, frankly, everybody is suddenly six inches taller, so you're much more visible. As the father of a five-foot-year-old, five-foot daughter, I really like her now being five-six when she crosses one of these streets. So it makes a big difference how far down that person's visible. So we have these raised crosswalks, and then, uh, so raised crosswalk here, um, and then this is still under construction, these slides, so all the line paintings aren't down here yet. Um, and then this is where the bike path crosses. This is the most aggressive. Um, so the entire thing is a raised tab table or raised intersection. So instead of just being a crosswalk, a six foot wide crosswalk, we've raised the entire intersection. We're allowing bicycles to cross at a 45 degree angle. So it used to be bicycles come out of the bike path, would zip, pick up speed, come out of the bike path, and zoom right into Pleasant Street and having some near crashes. Um, there's now a, a granite block. So it's not just cars are trying to slow down, sometimes it's bicycles. We don't want the bicycles to rush right in. We want them to have to make a 45 degree turn and go through the intersection, again, make things, you know, safer <laughs> in the whole process. So think about how these things all fit together. That's sort of what we're trying to do with the plan, is, is have this whole story. So the plan has sort of three elements, if you will. The one which the public got most involved is identifies a lot of projects in town. Um, these aren't necessarily the <coughs> priority projects, so in the order tonight, um, or I'm specifically saying, you're not necessarily approving every project. These are projects that seem to make sense. They shouldn't necessarily be in this priority, but it helps us think about what do we need. This priority list has already brought in $400,000 to the city. So the reason of the money we have on Pleasant Street, the first grant we got was for $400,000 for a complete streets grant. We got that money because you had to do a transition plan. Everybody else applied for mass dot money for the transition plan. We had this plan, so we used this for our transition plan. And that gave us $400,000 we beat. <coughs> so we've already, this plan's already paid for itself four times over, even though it's all grant money. So this will help in, you know, inform the process. DPW is going through a more extensive process now, looking at sidewalks. There's lots of other neighborhood meetings. So this is just one source of projects. Um, the other part of this plan is we know that we need to look at at Main Street in detail. So it used to be if I came before you 10 years ago, I would have held my, my head up high and said, this is great. We have one of the highest pedestrian use downtowns in the Commonwealth, certainly right west of Route 128, and we have very little crashes. The state does the 100 highest crash rate. <coughs> nothing showed up on the list. Then the state changed their methodology. They said, we're not just going to look at intersections. We're going to look at crash clusters. And we went from not being the top 100 to being the sixth worst crash cluster in the Commonwealth. So lots of crashes, 
on main, basically from Smith College to downtown and Pleasant Street down a couple of blocks. Lots of crashes and no one intersection spread around. It was a wake up call to us. If you ask anybody outside Northampton, what are the challenges on Main Street is that we have an incredibly wide Main Street. Now we've trained the drivers to stop for cars. <coughs> we have land use patterns that encourage that, but nonetheless, we have a lot of exposed distance for pedestrians that's through there. Um, and so th rethinking Main Street was part of what we're doing here in, in the process. Um, and then the, the, the plan that you may be most interested in is we have a series of goals, objectives, strategies, and actions. Um, and that's sort of the heart of the plan. That's what we hope the chapter one of the plan, if you have it in front of you, is what we hope to lift out of the plan and bring into sustainable Northampton. Again, there'll be more public process next year. I should say, in something, we had a separate grant. We have one grant that paid for the plan, a public health grant, and a second grant that just paid for community participation outreach. So we're able to do more community participation outreach than we almost ever do for other plans because we had this grant money out there. And so I'm just going to walk you through very quickly the six goal areas. I won't go in, in more detail than that. But these goals are basically what we have in Sustainable Northampton today. It's just a little more detail about them. So the first is we want to have safe and efficient transportation of, of p goods and people. Right? In, in all forms, right? So this is about bikes and peds, but it's not about bikes and peds at the expense of cars. Yes, on Pleasant Street, we want cars to go a little bit slower. But one of our basic goals is we don't want to create the toothpaste issue, where we say narrow Pleasant Street so much the cars cut through the neighborhood traffic. So we're very much saying, how do we slow the speed of traffic without creating new problems elsewhere? So we want to accommodate bicycles and pedestrians, but we still want life to be good for people. We, we know that 65% of us drive to work in single occupancy vehicles. Right? That is incredibly high for Boston New York, but it's incredibly low. It's a great number for cities of 30,000. So even though we're not a Boston New York number, we should be proud of that 65%. But we have to accommodate that 65%. That, that's a real part. So how do we accommodate all those different pieces? So then within that, the second goal is how do we make our system work better for bicycles and pedestrians. Right? My 93-year-old mother is not going to walk anywhere. Right? If she can walk 100 feet, I'm, I'm proud of her. Walking and biking should be a choice. But there are people in many parts of the world, in many parts of this, even the city, who drive because they're not comfortable walking. And that, that's the people we want to switch, the person who's willing. To, there's a magic number that planners use that says most people will walk four-tenths of a mile. Um, and beyond four tenths of a mile, they're going to drive. Below four tenths of a mile, they're going to walk. It shows up a lot in the planning literature, except it's really not true. Because there are cities, I, I did a project once in Virginia Beach, where the street was 12 lanes wide. And people would get in their car to cross the street. Literally, they're going 100 feet across the street. And they get in their car because it's too unsafe. Right. There's other places where it's a beautiful tree-lined street. You know, go to Amsterdam. Beautiful tree-lined streets with canals, and you walk three miles before you even notice it. So part of being bike pet friendly is thinking about that four-tenths of a mile, but it's also thinking about what are the little things to make you be willing to walk a little bit further and fool you. We don't, I, I teach at UMass part-time, and one of the, the, ch the assignments I always give my students is I give them a walking path through downtown that's seven-tenths of a mile and a walking path up King Street that's seven-tenths of a mile, and I ask which feels longer. And not surprisingly, everyone says, oh, King Street must be twice as long. Before they could look it up on, on Google Earth, they always said, oh, King Street is twice as long. Now they say it feels like it, but of course it's not. How do we make people feel like they can walk? Um, public transit, you had some discussion of that with Susan when you're talking about the budget. How do we make public transit work more? This isn't just about the funding, because we're not really dealing with the funding, it, but it's about thinking about where bus stops are. Right? Do, we do have a lot of say in where the bus stops are. Do we make buses go into stop and shop? Or is it worth having a pull off on King Street in front of stop and shop, which means the bus doesn't have to drive as far. That means the bus can go faster. So thinking about those kinds of things are within our, our control. Um, think about how, how do we get federal and state investments. <coughs> I think we're good at getting grants, but we're also involved at the political level of getting more money and more goodies. The mayor is our representative on the Metropolitan <laughs> Planning Organization, which divides up money in 43 cities and towns. And so that's an important part of our process. Um, how do we think about bicycle and vehicle parking? Um, I'm a bike pet advocate, probably second to none, but I think car parking is really important. I'm not one of the people who thinks we should get rid of car parking downtown. 
I am someone who wants to encourage us to park once and then make downtown friendly enough to walk that you don't, if you're going both to City Hall and Post Office, you don't necessarily feel like you need to move the car between those things. Um, for example, on Friday night when there's no parking downtown, you can park in Smith College parking garage for free and it's always avail available parking. How do we send out that message that people can park there? So thinking about both physical improvements and you know, um, soft improvements. The, the mayor commissioned the Walker parking study a couple of years ago, and that's part of what Walker talked about, is both supply but also, you know, everything else in, in the entire system. Um, and then how do we use education, encouragement, enforcement, evaluation? Is it an entire system, right? There's four E's we talk about for transportation. Um, enforcement, education, encouragement, and engineering. And they're all important. Engineering, we often focus on the most, but they're all important. You've all seen the wayfinding sign program we've done around the city. That's part of our encouragement effort. So when someone walks their dog, they say, oh, it's only a third of a mile to get somewhere. Maybe next time I'll walk it. Um, uh, and so that's sort of the, that's the overall big picture story. Oh, thank you. That was uh, questions, comments. Mm. Okay, I'll, oh, I'll count it down. Um, I would also add, um, Director Fighting <coughs> presented this in the Transportation and Parking Commission, um, which also voted to endorse it. And I appreciate it. It's kind of hard to break apart your entire presentation because it's spans a lot, there's lots of different components, but to try and discuss it, I'll pick up on what you said about speed bumps, um, which I absolutely agree with, and um, it's one reason why your voice is so valuable on the, on the Transportation and Parking Commission, since those issues come up constantly there. Um, it's just that if you want to tackle that issue, for example, traffic and speed, um, what, you, what we see in the plan before us um, is harder, takes more money, takes more thought um, than just putting down asphalt to build a, a speed bump. But that's why that's why I admire it, and I have to really thank you for not just bringing best practices and, and research, but also your practical experience, um, especially locally in Northampton, and all the public process that went into this. Um, so it's a very impressive document, but also everything that went into it. Um, before the document was produced um, is something I think people should be proud of in the city. So, um, yeah, I look, I look forward to endorsing it tonight as a full council. So. Uh, council Goodwill? I, I can't remember if we talked about this when you did your presentation of your resources, but, and this is probably another discussion for another day, but I've been thinking a lot more about driverless cars is not 20 years down the road. It's and it, it could fundamentally change our thinking about so much of this, including parking structures. So I, I, I realize that's kind of beyond the scope, but that must be on, on your mind as you, as you think about all this. Yeah, and you, you know, I go to conferences with futurists out there, and there's two totally different versions that are out there. One is it creates unlimited sprawl, and the other is great, and then let's see. So we don't really know where it's going to go, but certainly we talk about it. I mean, I, I am someone. I'm someone who rarely believes in parking garages. I, I've done a lot of projects in a lot of cities, and every city, even the dead ones, think they need a parking garage. I ger generally don't agree. I actually think we probably do need another parking garage, but I can see us doing a parking garage with flat decks that could be converted later if there's ever demand or if less. So yeah, absolutely thinking about that is important because you're right, it's coming in some form or other. Council of the Barge. Yeah, Wayne, I wanna thank you subcommittee also um, and with all your knowledge that you have and how our city is really really changing and it's for the safety of everybody in our city and also just reading about 300 public participants who engaged with this planning process that's what people want they want the transparency be able to form and be involved with any type of movement that's occurring here in the city. And I want to thank you for this. Um, the, uh, the thing that I find most heartening about this is, of course, is the holistic perspective and analysis. I mean, I, I've, you know, as transportation, you know, 
and parking committee evolved from originally from the parking commission and then became transportation and parking and now more transportation it's actually now become more of an avenue for neighborhoods to ask for corrective systems for speed digesting principally and it, it, the hope when we established the transportation parking commission was to to provide that holistic systemic analysis the toothpaste syndrome that you described that you know you you digest speed on one road it's not like what that will do is force other people to make something that was normally a secondary avenue is suddenly a primary and then we have to deal with that one <coughs> and that was the hope of the transportation parking commission ultimately and unfortunately it hasn't it's now kind of become something else it's become a, cl a complaint bureau and where people queue up for neighborhoods queue up for some type of mitigation without a sense of the consequences that it has larger in a larger sense that's why this is hard to me in so far as if we have a grand overview and a systemic overview on how we manage and control and usually it's perception as you point out it's more of an issue of perception if uh, um, uh, 25 mile an hour speed on a smaller digested street seems faster than it would on a wider boulevard prospect street being a perfect example where, where that type of digesting that it basically psych creating psychological landscapes that actually inspire people consciously or unconsciously to drive more thoughtfully and safely and I much prefer that to be honest I'm not a big speed bump fan I think I mean you know I know that um, in California of course where they got to design everything on a grid and alphabetize all their streets or do them numerically you have your primaries and then all secondary neighborhood streets are every other intersection is a four-way stop and then in between there's a speed bump and everyone drives very slowly down those streets but they only drive down those streets to get to their homes they rarely use them as a shortcut and consequently their primaries are clogged up and lots of frustration that comes to the so and we and our roads were not designed on a grid clearly ours were designed by the I Ching or something I'm or or random decisions that were <laughs> or goats whatever so consequently we we run into issues where we have to um, actually acquire some land in order to create a right angle turn on uh, up in Leeds right so because something that made sense once upon a time when it was a dirt road does not make any sense anymore you see the same problem where the roundabout scheduled to go on North King Street there's there's this weird angle there we have the weird intersection on King Street by Dunkin Donuts uh, and that that's not really an intersection or is it an intersection and no one really knows so <coughs> Another phenomenon that I find out that I realize and one of the reasons the roundabouts are such a success and four-way stops is actually creates a sense of doubt. This, this doubt actually makes, inspires caution in people. Now, as far as I can tell, no one in Northampton knows how to use a four-way stop and knows how to properly go through it. But consequently, they're all stopping. They're all, they're, there's no one's bolting through the intersection. Everyone's stopping going, I don't know, is it my turn? I'll, I'll go. Maybe and there's a lot of hesitation. The same with the roundabout. And as such, the traffic speed, traffic behavior is modified and mollified. So I, I have every intention of endorsing this. And as you said, there are a few items that I would take issue with, but I'm not the last word on this. And I'm certainly prepared to be more educated as this goes further. But I, I th think that every time that we've come up with a visioning plan and this type of process, which some people will roll their eyes at, it has all been to the good. It has all benefited us in a, in a larger sense that we can only appreciate when Wayne periodically comes in and gives us a, a throwback on the way, uh, a th you know, throwback to a time before when we look at it and we thought we were so brilliant then and it actually makes, and the things that we take for granted now didn't magically occur. They were part of a process, a larger process and a community process, a transparent process as Council Labard said and best practices as Council Labard. So I'm, uh, I'm gung-ho on this. Councilor Bidwell. Just, just one quick, quick point that we, we discussed when this was a community resource, and that is even though we're not going to have a new comprehensive plan for another year or whatever, whatever the process turns out to be, once this is adopted, 
for planning board purposes, this does become part of the comprehensive plan. Is that, that That's correct. correct? Just so we know there is some real significance to overvoting, not, right. not just well, vision. Um, so planning board's already adopted this. So, so that's what brought that. Well, that's already in yeah. effect. Right. Okay. Okay. So the, what what he's talking about is in the special permit criteria and site plan approval criteria, one of the criteria is conformance with city's comprehensive plans. So if someone's doing a, a big project, a project about a certain threshold, then yes, these standards do apply to them. And it should be noted that, as in all things, they are malleable and modifiable as, as circumstances call for. So it, it doesn't become permanently etched so that we're trapped into stuff. The whole idea is to facilitate best practices in a, in a continuum, so. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Hello. Uh, Council yeah, Nash. I, I, I'm, I'm going to endorse this even though um, I'm not completely a believer. For example, like we've already had a discussion about uh, the, we're, we're, we're doing a, a road diet on Pleasant Street, you know, and we're putting in some um, some needed parking, parallel parking spaces. My mind can't figure it all fitting. Wayne tells me it's gonna fit. So I'm gonna go on faith that once the lines go in, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this uh, in the next week to see that. And, um, but that, you know, often with, with these plans, you know, with the roundabouts, with this road diet, with the, the cycle tracks, you know, that are there gonna be more cycle tracks going down so that's so the so with your vote the city took over Pleasant Street from Holyoke to Hockman Road right. part of this original deal that got the roundabout in right. um, is that the state is going through the process of surplusing the rest of Pleasant Street going all the way down to the interstate or down to Dyke Road and that will assuming you all vote for it, that will eventually become a city road and at that point we should have that conversation I okay. think it'd be great right. to go down to Pleasant Street to Collins but we haven't done that yet but the, there is some faith that's required here of like, yeah, all right, we'll see what happens. And so far it keeps working out. So I will vote yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to that point, obviously there's resistance to anything that's perceived as a, a significant change. The, the roundabout by Look Park, of course, being the most demonstrative of that issue. The, there was a lot of initial opposition for a variety of reasons, uh, things like the engineer has never considered snow plows or school buses, which actually wasn't true, but the, or but there was a there was a protest. There were protests. There were resistance. It's also disruptive when they're being assembled. Then went to Pleasant Street. There's been complaints about Pleasant Street because of the disruption to traffic. Certainly about the roundabout. There was complaints associated with that, and that does come, and we will hear that as counselors. We're going to hear as these modifications occur that we, there will be concerns expressed. I think we should be prepared to explain them and understand them or the complaints and then also be prepared to explain what is being considered here. And that said, I mean, that's, that's the tougher part of our job is basically we're the firewall. We're, we're supposed to hear the concerns even expressed among counselors. For instance, like Councilor Nash is concerned about physics, how you can make Two things occupy the same space at the same time. It's not, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. But it's Apparently, possible. striping we'll is the magic, so we'll see. <laughs> but it is a leap of faith. And I just want to add so we're talking about traffic safety, but this covers other areas. So, you know, to Council Murphy's point about property tax, so I don't claim all the credit for this for Pleasant Street, but your Break King property has changed hands twice in the last year. And it went up substantially in value between the first sale and the second sale. And I think to some extent, it's this investment in Pleasant Street is making people say there's more valuable opportunities. So this should also be about getting more investment in Pleasant Street, both in terms of affordable housing and market rate housing and commercial development, which is good for us for taxes and good for us as a community. So, you know, that goes back to thinking as a city. <coughs> Any other comments or discussion on this? Okay, so this is this will be a roll call vote to uh, to endorse by order the walk bike Northampton citywide pedestrian and bicycle comprehensive plan, which will soon be reduced to an acronym, I'm sure. So, take it away, John. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Staying until I read it. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? 
Yes, so that passes with eight in favor, one abstention. Okay, so that's first reading. We'll revisit this actually on seventh on September seventh at our next meeting. Okay, uh, we're up to item seventeen point three six eight. This is an order accepting lot four of the street in Village Hill for the municipal and other purposes. First reading. Second. Motion and second there. So. <coughs> <coughs> And this, uh, this is what was discussed in, um, <coughs> excuse me, in finance, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This one, was. this one was discussed in finance, but it, yeah. Right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And came with a positive, positive recommendation. recommendation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Came with a positive recommendation. It's been so long, so I'm sorry. Uh, any further discussion on this item? Okay, John, roll call, please. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading and second reading will be September 7th. Item 17.369 is an order authorizing the purchase of 55 acres on East Hampton Road, Route 10, and on Old Wilson Road for conservation, municipal, and or other purposes. Move to approve. Second. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Council Klein second. Okay. Uh, further discussion on this? Council Murphy? Yeah, I'd like to continue to opine on this for a minute since it's, it's, we're being talked about this evening. Well, no, yeah. And, uh, and in addition to the planning director, I too have been around for a long time. <laughs> and I remember when we created the concept of the office park um, because we look at the fact that we're about 21% commercial and more commercial relieves pressure on residential tax rate. And this was an area where we thought we'd grow, so we created it as an office park. Part, part of its potential to develop it as an office <coughs> park was to put a sewer line out there, because there is no sewer line out there and it could never be an office park without a sewer line. But we never put a sewer line out there. Um, I don't even think we tried very hard to put a sewer line out there. Um, so that never really became viable. I also remember when we did our vernal pool zoning, and when we did that, we spoke about the fact that it was going to have tremendous impact on the very parcel that we're taking tonight. So I completely agree that it's not worth $600,000 anymore, but to a great extent, it was either our intact activity or what we did do that took the value away. And it is sort of a fait accompli that it's now turning into a wildlife quarter because that talk has been around for many years that Chuck said would make a nice wildlife quarter. My concern is, and I have no doubt we're going to vote to buy it and turn it into the wildlife quarter that many intend that it should always be, but we don't have a lot of places to diversify our tax base. And I, I just continue to be concerned that if we don't do that or do something to mitigate our tax rate, that it's going to be hard to get overrides when we need overrides. Uh, and that what we're going to do is create a real wonderful city that you got to be rich to live in because the cost per thousand is going to go up to the point where the average person isn't going to be able to live here. I mean, we already look at the fact that it's hard for our school teachers, our firefighters, and our police officers to live in this community. And it's, it's only going to get worse, uh, both in this case by not permitting development there, and then on top of it to whack $14,000 off the tax rolls. Um, and a lot of that value went away because we didn't do what we were going to do originally, and, and we just haven't, we haven't been trying to truly create opportunity to develop commercially to offset our, our tax base. Um, I know one of these pieces, the O'Brien piece, I tried very hard to sell for a while. And you couldn't because having to put a septic system it was unrealistic to run a sewer line East Hampton. The wet, there were some wetlands, too much so to put up a building in a septic system. So it's undevelopable. And they basically said, okay, we'll sell it for what we can get to the city of Northampton for conservation land. So it, we truly, I mean, I have no doubt we're going to buy this tonight. Um, and I'll probably point this out again in the future. I just don't see in the long run, and I have a very long term perspective on Northampton, do not want to see us become the kind of place where you got to have a six-figure income 
to live and survive uh, unless you live in something that's subsidized. And, and that's really the direction we're going in. So I, sh I shall leave it at that. Uh, Councilor Boudoir. Um, I, 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 I very much agree and share the, share, share the concern that, 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 that we just have largely run out of, of, of commercially developable space and that has implications for our, our tax base and the distribution between residential and, and, and commercial tax. And I, I too worry about that. However, going back to the days when Terry Anderson was economic development director and looking at this site, it, it, it seems like it always had four or five strikes against it. Mm -hmm. And it was just never, this was never going to be our solution. If, if it wasn't, if it wasn't lack of sewer, it was the slopes. It wasn't the slopes, it was the vernal pools. It wasn't the vernal pools, it was the complications in assembling these diverse ownership parcels. So I, I share the concern, but I, 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 I never, I, I don't think I ever really thought this was going to be the solution. So I, I don't have too much difficulty in officially declaring the vision of a business park, an office park down there dead, because I never thought it was going to be, for the record. Uh, you are. You want to. You, you want to speak I to this as the sponsor. I just want to add also that you know I've been involved in the whole discussion about the business park, um, and it's a policy question. So would we spend? How many millions and millions of dollars would we spend to essentially put in a sewer system for three property owners? Would we recoup the fourteen thousand? We'd probably end up spending way more than the fourteen thousand. Uh, many many developers in the city pay to put in infrastructure. Um, if a project is viable. So I, I hear what you're saying, and, I'm, and believe me, we stuck with this plan for a long, long time. Um, but it is true, the, the, the elevations, the driveways, we had five colleges look at it they, to look at building. They wanted to build their storage facility there. Um, but how long a driveway did you have to, you have to build a really long driveway just to get to the flat part. Um, it's a really difficult site to develop. So I hear what you're saying completely, Councillor, and I believe me, no one wants to increase the commercial tax base more than I do. I just think that there's also a thing which I know you respect, which is the free market. And if these were really, um, you know, properties th that could be developed, someone would have either paid for the infrastructure or uh, there would have been developers coming for, or, or businesses coming forward saying, we want to reloc, we want to locate there. We could apply for grants um, to, to try to get that infrastructure. So, and then the only other thing I want to say is we also it also fell into uh, you know a lot of development and, and infrastructure went up to Hospital Hill, which you know. So a lot of grant money went up there as well. So I know that was one of the other issues. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to I I take the councilor's point, um, but I also believe that if these were the properties that you're ascribing to them, they would have sold easily. Mm -hmm. And we would have found the grant money for the infrastructure. Um, and so that's, you have to balance it out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And just to reply to that, it's not three properties. The sewer does not cross the Mill River Diversion. So it's, it's uh, Richard's Plumbing. It's the Cyril's property, which will be developed at some point in time. It's where the tractor supply place it's the Mini Mart. It's Phillips Enterprises, which has been hampered because they, they have septic systems there. It's Mr. Thompson's land on the other side. It's where the fuel tank is. It's where the recyclers are. It's where Wayside Auto Body is. It's where uh, there's a building on the other side of the bike path. I mean, there's, it's not three properties. It's, it's a corridor that currently has commercial development, has the potential for some more that is handicapped because it doesn't have the sewer line. And, you know, I agree, a lot of our resources went went to the state hospital and you know when that is done and completely built out I'd like to do a little economic analysis and compare what it costs to host the residentials to what we're making on the commercials because we we changed that plan several times as we went along but that that's a story for another day but there there are more than three properties down there that would have benefited from the sewer line no doubt um, and none of them or even several of them could have ever afforded to fund the cost of a sewer line over there. That really had to be something that we did in coordination with East Hampton uh, to bring that along, so. So, in, in, and I think the, so far as I understand, the gist of your argument is that not so much this particular plot, but it's the camel's nose under the tent and or that it's uh, something that signals that there's less likely to be developed a sewer line 
Well, we took it, we basically, you know, because now for what remains, it's unlikely we'll spend the money to do that. So, you know, we are, we are taking it. We made a case that, well, they're valued at, they're not worth what they're taxed at. We had something to do with that. And uh, so it does make it sort of a fait accompli. Can I uh, ask Klein. for clarification on those points? So the, all of the different businesses that you just talked about, where exactly are they in relation to this piece of they're property? Before, they're between the diversion bridge right after what used to be the auto dealer that now. K lanes. Yeah. From there to the bike path bridge, th these properties basically are more or less after that. Um, but between the South Street Bridge and the Bike Path Bridge, those properties are there and don't have sewer either. Um, so the, the property that's being addressed here is near the sunny yeah, side. We're on the other side of the, yeah. right. Yeah, between the Opposite Bike Path Bridge and recycling. sunny, whatever they call it. Sunny right? side. Yeah, sunny side, yeah. So further down the road. And I think actually sunny side pumps to East Hampton. They go the other I, way. I think yeah. you're right. Yeah, Any other comments or discussion or debate? Council down. Just you know, the other the other side to the good points Councilor Murphy raises is, I mean, the financial pressures of the city of Northampton and every other city. Um, I don't think you could say fairly that you could solve all of them with um, unlimited commercial development. I mean, we just had a debate about. Single-payer health care. Health care costs go up and up and up all the time. Um, I would say that's a larger driver of, of, of costs. Um, and uh, I wouldn't expect you could make it up with commercial development exclusively. Um, I'm ready to acquiesce that the die is sort of cast on this one. But I, you know, this may appear again. And uh, I'm just debating your point. Yeah. This may appear again, and it's the opposite as I of said, the die being cast because I'm debating. Yeah, it, the, it, the, die, the die is sort of cast on this one, but well, um, okay. if it comes up again, it comes up again. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion on this? Uh, John, roll call, please. Councillor Murphy. No. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. <coughs> Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. <coughs> Passes in first reading, uh, eight in favor, one opposed. I will be at a second reading on uh, September 7th. The next item is 17.346. This is in order to approve uh, a deed from the city to Rebecca J. Duggan and John P. Duggan, Jr. Uh, this is second reading, except I'm uh, uh, Councillor Labarge, you want to recuse <coughs> yourself? Uh, Councillor Labarge will be recusing herself from this discussion and vote. So, is there a motion? Move to second. Second, okay. Any further discussion on this item? Uh, Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Okay. That passes in second reading. It's safe to come in. There, okay. There we go. Councillor Labarge, get back on our seat. We did. <laughs> I, item, thank you. So, so, thank you. Item 17.347 <laughs> this is in order to authorize a purchase of land at the intersection of Leonard Street and Haydenville Road. Second reading. Second. Motions made by Councilor Bidwell, seconded by Councilor Klein. Uh, any further discussion on this? This is also part of, actually part of the uh, walk bike plan, actually. Uh, okay, roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. I'm sorry, Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Then Murphy. Yes, still. Thank Murphy. <laughs> Councilor Nash. Does that yes. count twice? <laughs> you count twice. You did the divided vote. Um, okay, that passes in second reading. 
Item 17.359, this is an order to authorize the acquisition by purchase, gift, or eminent domain of a storm drain easement. Uh, second reading. Council Labar just made a motion to approve. Is second. A second. Council Sheriff seconds is, seconds is. Holy cats. Uh, Your Honor, you have an update on this? I do. I do, actually. It's a breaking, breaking news. Um, <laughs> uh, at uh, 5.30 p.m. Uh, this afternoon, I sat with uh, Mr. Willard at his kitchen table, and we signed an agreement. Um, so we have an agreement um, that gets us through this process. Um, and uh, essentially, the agreement is that um, we will um, we will be acquiring the easement from uh, Mr. Willard, uh, the, the easement that we need for the storm water uh, work, and in exchange, instead of um, instead of a cash purchase, uh, we will be um, uh, designing and installing a, a new sewer connection, a, a proper sewer mm -hmm. connection. Um, and so we, and then we will be. Um, uh, I'll actually be coming back to you uh, because we will also then be granting him an easement um, in our basically on Holyoke Street for his new uh, sewer line. Um, and so we have uh, worked that out. Um, it took us a while, and I had a couple of different meetings with him. Attorneys uh, spoke. Um, the building commissioner, I was part of it. Uh, DPW director Donald Escalia was part of it. Um, and so we've come to an agreement, um, like I said, at 5.30 p.m. Uh, this evening. So what I, I would ask you to... Um, Vote yes on this second reading. Um, the other, the part of the agreement is that we will um, uh, be um, executing a friendly taking. Um, so we will still acquire the easement um, uh, through a through eminent domain, but it's a, a so-called friendly taking, meaning that he signed an agreement knowing that we would do that. And the reason for this and. For counselors who've been involved in takings where we've done other easements or where we've done bicycle paths or we've done whatever it is, um, if we have a choice between a purchase or a friendly taking, the friendly taking cleans the title completely. Um, and so if there's some remnant of something, <coughs> 1800s, it, it completely clears the title. Um, so from Alan's perspective, it's a, it's a much better way to do it. Um, and so, um, so when you do vote on this, I am going to ask you to sign the order of taking. Uh, but again, I have a signed agreement with him. We have agreement between the attorneys. Um, and we're going to be, uh, we've already begun the initial design work for his uh, sewer system. Well, uh, OK, this then a procedural the question. Yeah. This is not the thing. No, I know. This is not the thing. Yeah. But the, as a procedural, uh, would that require for us to sign the eminent domain yeah. The friendly, not the friendly taking, as opposed to the adverse taking, does that require a discussion and a vote? Uh, uh, no, you're th what you're you're voting tonight to authorize the eminent domain. Right. So you're you're as one of the three options. So say, right, that's right. So Purchase, so gift, or eminent domain. Yes. Okay. So you're so. authorizing that it be that it be acquired through one of those three means. <coughs> so the, the next act that you would have to take would be there's an. There's an order of taking, taking. which has right. all of your signatures on it. Um, and so the next decision point would be, do uh, six of you want to sign it um, so to finalize the deal? Um, and again, I can, I, I have the, um, you have you know, copies, I, have, I have a signed agreement and, um, you know, between the, between the two parties. And it does stipulate that we will acquire uh, you know, take, transfer must take place on or before September 1st. Uh, the city shall have the sole discretion as to whether to take the drainage easement by friendly eminent domain or by deed. Um, and then, you know, it just goes on to say that uh, it has all the usual disclaimer language for friendly takings. Um, uh, another question is that uh, did, were there any modifications on the original proposed easement about 30 None feet? Whatsoever. So it's the same exact. Mental easement. same. So, okay. No, it's the 30 foot easement. Uh, there's no change. It's just, um, you know, a different road to Dublin, as they say, because right. uh, we, we, you know, he, we were uh, attempting to purchase it, um, and uh, and he wanted, uh, he was more focused on the sewer right. issue. Is so he, does this clear Mr. Willard of any liability uh, extent? Uh, uh, 
current liability that he may hold by the um, un unauthorized connection on the uh, well it, uh, at this point the connection is going to be cut in three weeks um, because the the contractor will be moving in to begin uh, decommissioning the storm sewer line and so it's going to be cut and he's you know we're going to be capping it and we'll be the agreement also stipulates that uh, we will be providing alternative uh, sanitary facilities during the construction process so we will be working with him to bring in a porta potty so he'll have facilities which he's required to have as a business he's fine with that that's part of the agreement um, so yeah. he's, he's, he, but my question is he's not subject to any retroactive liability for for the, um, the 50 60 with, some odd years that the not with the city that okay. I'm the, the city is certainly not um, exercising anything. okay there's no but yeah. they wanted some clarity on that so yep, no nope. city's not acting yeah okay. yep nope there's it's, it's it's a very basic document so okay uh, so regarding the, the order for the taking you said uh, the contract says by September 1 so we, so you, we can't really wait till the September meeting. We no. We, we really need six signatures on the an fact order that tonight. you're all in one room is yeah. why I'd want you to sign it tonight. Yeah, I got um, you. Just because it's easier to get you yeah. all to sign it. Yeah. Um, and again, it's uh, yeah. I know that Councillor uh, Nash, Nash uh, <laughs> also <laughs> happened to chat with um, uh, Mr. Willard this afternoon. Yep. Like, Six o'clock. So I don't know. Right after, know. right after your late breaking news, I contacted him on the way in because I had already. I mean, there's been a lot of outreach by the, on my part, but especially by the mayor and his staff to uh, come to some sort of agreement here. And I'm really glad that tonight there's an agreement on the table. And um, and uh, I'm happy to report that Mr. Willard is, is pleased with with the agreement. And, um, and so therefore, I'm going to be voting yes on this. Um, I, I was a little wary of, of voting against, you know, a taking for a constituent. And, uh, but now that this has been negotiated, I'm, I'm feeling good about this. So everything the mayor is reporting is true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness for that. Except I don't have anything in writing. <laughs> well, you won't. <laughs> Okay, any other discussion on this item? Uh, roll call on this, please, John. Councillor Shaw. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. That passes unanimously in second reading. Um, and uh, the mayor will be passing that around at the end of the meeting for. Well, I guess we have, the enrollment committee's going to have to sign a bunch of stuff anyway, so that all the remaining counselors can take some time to sign this as well. <coughs> there you go. Okay. <coughs> and now we move into ordinance. And this is item 17.331. This is an ordinance to amend uh, Chapter 312-110 regarding the roundhouse parking lot. The second reading motions from maybe a council of arts. Second. 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 Councilor Klein seconds and Councilor Sharon. <laughs> Crazy seconding. Uh, any further discussion on this item? Take it away, John. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. All right, that passes in second reading. The next item we're addressing is item 17.3.367. This is an ordinance to amend 156 uh, 5A plus 5C to allow uh, CBA oversight over some exempt projects to modify some exemptions. And this is for referral. There's, uh, Council Donald, you want to refer a bunch? Yes. Can we just, can we refer all of them? Yes. The, but it, 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 well, well, what, well, the next two are to, uh, well, first one well, is to legislative matters. The other one's to TPC to the and the legislative level. matters. Okay. Well, uh, why don't we do this, this one, one and then we'll do the others as a group? How's that sound? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Any discussion on the referral? Actually, was there a motion? Move to refer. Second it. I'll move to refer and there's a second. Oh, discussion. Um, community resources has dealt with zoning. In the past, 
you want to also refer to community resources? I don't know. It's kind of, we've kind of been, you yeah. know, referring it to that committee sometimes and other times not doing it depending on whatever, so. But I'll certainly that as a motion. jurisdiction. Is that a motion? Yeah. Second? Community okay. resources. Second. Uh, all those in favor of amending to include a referral to community resources, please say aye. 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 So that was a motion to add to the, to amend. And now we're back to the original order, which now is as amended. Uh, all those in favor, please aye. say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that is referred as amended with two committees to sit there. Um, I, so uh, the request now is to have item 17.370, item 17.375, item 17.376, and also item 17.377, and also item 17.378, and also item 17.379, every damn thing left on the, on the, but to move them as a group. And I will just read the headlines for that. Um, back up to 17.370, this is an ordinance to amend parking zone time limit class on Green Street. And then this is for referral to Transportation Parking Commission and the on legislative matters. Same referral for item 17.375, an ordinance relative to parking on Franklin Street. Also same referral, item 17.376 is an ordinance relative to parking on Main Street. And then uh, same referral for item 17.377 is an ordinance relative to parking on Conn Street. And then item 17.378, this is an ordinance relative to parking on Henshaw Avenue. And then lastly, item 17.379, an ordinance relative to parking on Prospect Street. Need so to refer the group. Second. second. Need to refer to the group and seconded. Any discussion on the referrals? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So actually updates. One of the updates is sitting in my left here. Um, <laughs> it's, it's John Fry actually, God bless him, stepped up here to help us out and he had a little crash course and we and then his baptism by fire tonight and um i have to say how grateful i am that he is he and for people in the public you probably know john, john fry if you're standing at the pump just sort of dazing while you're holding <laughs> the pump handle and looking at the pump you go hey well, there's john fry his name's on this mm -hmm. he, he he autographs every <coughs> just all the pumps in this area <laughs> just for fun <laughs> he just, so he's come out in the open he's come out exactly. in the open we, we, uh, also more importantly he's also uh one of the original developers and fun uh, uh founders of the hot chocolate run hmm. when back when like three people run. and john would run <laughs> you're in in. polar bear yes yeah i never ran yeah i did run actually yes yes john you'll see running in a polar bear out <coughs> so i mean more to his credit so once again, thank you very much, John. I really do appreciate that, and and uh, you did you did a great job tonight. So I appreciate thank you. that. Councilor, be Nack. filling in in the future, or he will be. He is serving in an interim basis. We don't want to burn him out, though. But in the meantime, there is a job position that's been posted in Human Resources. If anyone's interested in the position, it's uh, the criteria is all laid out. Uh, if you go to the Northampton City website and go to HR and you can find the post. So, yeah, because I don't think John would take this on as a permanent job on a bet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Council of Arts. Yeah, are we, do we have to sign in enrollment? Yeah, there's a couple yes. things in enrollment that you'll have to sign. So, with that, that comes to our final vote. I need a motion, though. Motion to adjourn. Motion's made and seconded. Uh, Council O'Donnell and Bidwell, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you all very much, and we'll see you in September. See you in September. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, uh, I need to over the picture.